All right, and we are being recorded now. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Joe Graham. Uh, I've got a background in graduate school. I was mostly an experimental neuroscientist, but that generates a lot of data. And I was like, what are you going to do with all that data? Uh, you know, so I started building models, and uh, that actually ended up being more fun in a lot of ways. Uh, so I sort of switched over to computational neuroscience. Uh, I've worked a lot with um, uh, single cell models and network models. Um, I'm really interested in morphology uh, and analysis and generation of morphology. And yeah, I joined the software working group uh, a while back, uh, over a year ago probably now, um, just to have a chance to interact with other people who are working in computational neuroscience and specifically software. I'm a uh, developer for NetPine now, which is an open source Python package. Uh, it stands for networks using uh, Neuron and Python. So it's like a wrapper for Neuron that allows you to build, easily build very complex uh, network models. And yeah, so today we're going to give an introduction to Python. And the first thing we're going to talk about is using virtual environments. And virtual environments are part of my daily workflow. Uh, every time I go to work on NetPine, I make a new virtual environment. I install the software. Then I go and do my developing and my changing, and I, and I push it back. Uh, and then I can just delete that virtual environment. And whenever I need a new one, I can start a new one. Uh, so they're very powerful, very useful, and they isolate everything from your system. So on your system, a lot of times there are conflicting packages and one things need one version or another version. And so this just keeps it nice and clean. So whatever specific thing you're working on, you can create a virtual environment, uh, do everything there, and that doesn't affect your system and it's easy to get rid of later. Um, so yeah, so the first thing, let's, uh, it'd be obviously better for you if you wanna make this interactive. So go ahead and open up a terminal and uh, there is a link uh, to the Jupyter Notebook in the chat, which I will repost now. So you can see that. And that's an interactive uh, Jupyter Notebook, but uh, we need to install all the stuff before we can get you using that. So the first part is not in the interactive notebook. Uh, so I do all my work on the desktop. So I'm gonna CD uh, to my desktop. Just zoom in more on this here. Okay, so in my desktop, I'm just going to make a temporary directory, which I can delete when this is all over. And I'm going to change into it. Uh, so yeah, so the first thing you, you want to know is what's, uh, what Python are you using? Where is it? So if you type Python 3 dash dash version, I'm using Python 3.8.2. And uh, to see uh, where that is coming from, uh, it's coming from user slash bin slash Python 3. Um, great. So yeah, so now we are going to uh, make our virtual environment. And the great thing about this is it's uh, built into Python, so it doesn't require any additional installation. As long as you have Python 3, you can make a virtual environment using Ven. Uh, the way this command works, Okay, so in my temperature, there's nothing in here right now. Uh, so we're going to do Python 3 dash M venv. And then this last uh, is this last bit ENV. Uh, you can you can name your virtual environments anything, but uh, to keep it easier, most people uh, will call them ENV or VENV. Uh, and that way uh, I, I make virtual environments all over the place. So if I use different names for each one, none of my commands would work properly. Uh, so it's nice to keep consistent naming, but again, it doesn't have to be called env, you can call it my env, you can call it so whatever you want. But when we execute python 3-m venv, and then the name of the environment we want, uh, now we can see in my temp directory, we've got a directory called env up here. And uh, yeah, there's not going to be much in it right now, but uh, nothing in include, uh, just python 3.8 in the lib. Yes, so now we want to see, uh, no, first, first we have to get into it. So we've created it, it lives in this uh, ENV directory, but we're not actually in it in our terminal right now. In order to get into it, we have to source one of the files in there. So in env, in bin, there is a file called activate. And this is what uh, brings you into your virtual environment. So from the command line here, we're going to do source env 
slash bin slash I'm going to hit AC and then hit tab and it brings me out to activate. Okay, so when we run that file now we can see at the prompt on our terminal includes this uh, env in parentheses so that's how we know that we are in our virtual environment now. Uh, Great. So now, yeah, so now we can see which uh, which Python we're using and where it's coming from. So uh, Python Python three dash dash version. So it's the same version uh, as the one we were using as, as the one that's outside of the virtual environment. But now, if we do which Python three, ah, it no longer lives in user bin. Uh, now it lives in my virtual environment here. Okay. So this is the uh, it's like isolated from the rest of your system and anything we install with uh, pip will just will just live here, just like this version of Python lives here. Uh, yes, if we want to. Uh, so, yeah, you're in your virtual environment. You can see by your prompt. If you want to get out of it, uh, you can just enter deactivate. Uh, and now you're back in your normal uh, normal system. The Python three you'd be using is, is in user bin in my case. And then later at any time to get back in, you can just do a uh, source and bin activate. And I just type source space en and then hit up the up arrow and it, it brought up the latest command that started with that. And now I'm back in the virtual environment. Um, yeah, uninstalling a virtual environment is easy because it shouldn't, it doesn't affect your system in any way. So at the end of this, I, I made this in a temp directory. I'm going to delete the whole thing, and it won't have affected my system in any way. Uh, you can delete uh, the environment. Actually, lives in here, so you can just delete this and make a fresh one if you want. Or for whatever reason, uh, an installation becomes a breeze. Okay, so inside a virtual environment, now we're going to we're going to need all the Python packages uh, that we want to use. Um, but the very first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to upgrade uh, pip and its dependencies and make sure we've got the latest versions of all of those. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do that right away. The command's gonna be Python three dash M pip install dash dash upgrade. And then we wanna do pip setup tools and wheel, uh, which are all part, parts of pip that allow it to install things. So yeah, that's a, a long command. You can copy it or, or type it in directly. Great, so Python 3 and pip install. Now, if we look in our, uh, yeah, right, Python 3.8 site packages. Yeah, so uh, the, all the site packages for your Python will be installed in lib, uh, Python, your version, site packages. So you can see we installed setup tools and wheel and then pip is there now. Yes, okay, so now that pip's updated, uh, just some common uh, pip commands here to see what uh, packages you all have installed. You can do Python 3-m pip list. And you can see that right now, we just have those three things we put in, pip setup tools and wheel. Uh, if you wanna get more information about a package, you can do Python 3-m pip show uh, and it'll give you the name, the version, you know, a little bit of information uh, about whichever package you're, you're interested in. Uh, and then, yeah, so the, uh, you know, the most common um, command you're going to use is going to be pip install. Um, to install the latest version of anything, it's just python 3 m pip install and then the name of the package. Uh, if you want to install it so that it's editable, okay, so let's say you're, um, there's a bug in a package that's, that you want to use, and, and, and it's not, uh, nobody's fixed it yet, but you have to fix it. So you could make, you would install it with this dash E flag, and then it'll, it'll download that package uh, into setup, into um, site packages here. Uh, but then if you can go into site packages and edit it. So if I were to go into, um, uh, I mean, these aren't really Python pure Python packages. But if I were, uh, you can't really edit these because they've already been used to create your virtual environment. Um, it's sort of static. If you want to be able to modify something and have it be reflected in your virtual environment, you have to include this uh, dash E tag. 
Um, so yeah, let's see here. Install a specific version. Uh, you would do uh, Python 3M pip install and then uh, pull and then uh, equals equals uh, equals equals uh, whatever version number you want. So sometimes uh, latest the latest version of a package will cause your code to break. And so you want to use the previous version for a while. So yeah, you can set it equals equals to the version number you want. Uh, you can even do it fancy. You can say greater than or equal to any version numbers or less than or equal to any version numbers or even greater than and less than uh, with, a, with a comma in between. So that's how you can get uh, different versions of whatever uh, Python package you're interested in. And you can also uh, install a package directly from version control software like uh, Git or GitHub, Mercurial, um, all of those. Oh, and uh, are there, I'm sorry, I'm not paying any attention to questions. Uh, quick look here. What's the purpose of using a virtual environment rather than just using Python itself? Is it just so the changes you're making are isolated and it don't affect the entire system? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Necker already answered. Yeah, I would say that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, uh, some packages require different versions of other packages. And so by isolating each project you're working on in a separate virtual environment, each one is set up exactly the way you want it and you don't have any concerns. Uh, yeah, whenever you're playing around. I mean, I don't just use them when I'm playing around. Literally, you know, say I'm going to go fix a bug in NetPine. I'll create a virtual environment, install NetPine, editable, uh, and all the other software, enter that virtual environment, make my changes, uh, push them back to uh, GitHub, and then I'll just delete that directory, and, and I'm ready to start again on whatever the new problem is. Uh, so, yeah, so installing... Uh, yes, you can also uh, install from a local copy. So the way I actually uh, install NetPine when, I, when I'm working on development stuff is I'll git clone uh, the NetPine, and then I'll say Python 3-m pip install e uh, NetPine, which is the name of the folder uh, where it gets downloaded as, and that installs it directly from your local machine. Uh, and then uninstalling a package is easy. Python 3-m pip uninstall uh, the package name. Um, so yeah, let's just do Python 3-m pip list. Uh, yeah, so right now we just have pip setup tools and wheel. Um, so let's go ahead and um, yeah, let's just try because you'll probably on uh, PyPy, uh, the Python package index, you know, there's many, many uh, packages, um, but also sometimes and it's super easy because you just have another package name and you can immediately install it. But a lot of times you want to install some some code that's still sort of. I mean, it's just in a GitHub repo. Uh, so let's talk about this real quick. We're just going to install uh, NetPine really quickly from its GitHub repo. Uh, and we'll do it editable uh, so you can see what that looks like. So I'm going to want to do Python 3-m pip install. And I'm going to make it dash e so it's editable. And then it's, yeah, git plus and then uh, the repository name. So I'm going to say git plus. Yeah, you can try this on any repository you'd like. I just know NetPy and I know this works. So I'm going to use this for the example. So I'm going to copy the uh, URL from this, uh, from the repo here. So then we've got git plus and, uh, and the URL. And, Joe, and Joe uh, sorry, can you also, once you run the command, can you paste it in the chat? It'll just make oh, it yeah, that's your thing. Yeah. Let's copy yeah, from well, there. Good idea. Uh, yeah, so that's the, the repo. And then, um, oh yeah, so there are uh, different branches. Most uh, GitHub repos have different branches. So if you don't want to use the main branch, you'd use at uh, whatever the name of your branch is. Um, and inside your repo, it, it has to know what the name of the project is. So you got to do a pound egg equals the name of the project. And in our case, the name of the project is just a NetPine and it lives in NetPine. 
So that should work. Copy this into the chat. Great. Okay, and uh, oh yeah, so you'll see one thing that's nice about pip is that it'll automatically install any dependencies of any package you're installing. So NetPine has, you know, dozens of dependencies, NumPy, SciPy, you know, a lot of these uh, standard packages uh, that get used. Um, so yeah, so now in our uh, directory, we can see that uh, I'm in, um, uh, in my environment in lib, Python, uh, site packages. Now we can see, oh, wow, we've got a ton of stuff in here now. Uh, and we should have an editable version of NetPine. I thought it would live here. Uh, yeah, well, this is not how I normally make an editable version. But uh, anyways, that shows you that, yes, you can um, uh, pip install directly from a GitHub repo. Um, different branches. Uh, yeah, so the way I would actually normally do this, let's do uh, Python 3-m pip uninstall netpine. Yes. Okay, so I've uninstalled uh, netpine. And uh, the way I do this as a developer is I actually clone, oops. That's not what I want. And if I remember the uh, bash shortcuts from yesterday, I could have deleted that line immediately, but instead I have to hold down uh, backspace like a chump. Uh, so I do a git clone uh, from my repo. I can do an ls. So now I can see I've got my netpine uh, directory in here along with my env. And I can do uh, python 3 m pip install. I'm going to do a dash e. You know, if you're going to have it locally, you probably want to be able to edit it and just point it to that directory. And, uh, and now netpine is reinstalled directly from my local copy of netpine uh, here in, uh, in the temp directory we created. Uh, oop, and I can copy those two commands as well. Paste them into the chat in case somebody wants to try them. Okay, great. So yeah, installation, uninstallation, all that stuff. Great. Um, now we want to be able to use uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And these are a really nice way to play around and explore things because it saves all your commands and the figures and everything. And you can save them and share them. Other people can run them. Uh, but uh, it doesn't run right out of the box. We have to install a few things first. And uh, yeah, so we're going to have to uh, upgrade, install IPython, IPyKernel, and Jupyter, obviously, in order to use these. So Python 3-M pip install upgrade, IPython, IPyKernel, uh, and Jupyter. So it's going to install uh, those and all their dependencies, which are quite a few. Great, so let's do uh, Python 3-m pip list, there we go, Python 3-m pip list. And yeah, so we've got a ton of stuff installed now, IPyKernel, IPython, uh, we're good to go. Uh, in order for uh, Jupyter to be able to use your virtual environments, uh, you have to create a kernel out of your virtual environment. Uh, and that's what this command uh, here does. Um, I Python space kernel space install space dash dash user space dash dash name equals env. And if you named your virtual environment something that other than env, obviously you'll have to change that here uh, also. But great, so that has created a, um, a kernel that which we can then use in Jupyter Notebook. And yeah, let's go ahead and just try that out right now. So we're going to go uh, Jupyter space notebook. And it should open a new Jupyter notebook in my browser. All right. Uh, it's there's two things in the directory I'm in. Um, let's see, I can't change the kernel. Oh, okay, we have to go to a new. So here in the upper right, 
there's a new button. And uh, normally, uh, you would only the only kernel you would have in here is a Python three kernel using your system uh, Python three. But because we made a kernel out of our virtual environment, we can use that for a new um, for a new Python notebook. Uh, it's empty, but we should be able to import like uh, NetPine, for example. Uh, <laughs> okay, well ignore that. <laughs> I don't know what that problem is. Or NumPy had to have been installed. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, it works. Uh, we're in our virtual environments. Uh, yes, yeah, so all the packages we installed are available here. Any changes you make to your virtual environment, any new packages you install, anything will be available here. Uh, from so, within here, you can Joe? even uh, do uh, system commands. You, if you need, oh, I need another piece, another package. I don't uh, know. Joe? The terminal. Yep. Uh, uh, I think in the chat, a couple of uh, them are asking if you could uh, maybe just go back a, a bit. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. OK, so to get to, yeah, to get to this, we had to do um, uh, the uh, Python 3 dash M. Let me I'm gonna open a new tab here. OK, so yeah, so the command to uh, to install everything uh to for jupyter notebooks is python 3-m pip install upgrade ipython ipykernel jupyter uh, so yeah so that will install uh everything oh no i'm installing it into my own system see you got to be careful here in your virtual environment <laughs> uh all right let me get a new tab again um so yeah, I'm in my uh, directory here. So I want to uh, source and bin activate here. Now I'm in my virtual environment. Um, and yes, so once you installed it using uh, this command, then uh, yeah, to, to run a Jupyter notebook is, is simply uh, this command here. And that'll open it in whichever uh, browser you have active um, and, and bring up a nice Jupyter notebook. So did everybody, uh, did everybody get that going? And if not, uh, stop me. All right. And uh, so the Jupyter notebook in the browser should just show the end folder. Yes, correct. Uh, it's it's just showing whichever directory you started it from, and the only thing we have in that directory right now is the end of the folder. Um, and then yeah, so when you want to do a new notebook, whenever you want to do a new notebook, you know you could there's you've got two uh, kernels available: the Python three, which is just stock Python three, and the one that we've created with everything installed. Great. Okay. So yeah, so now that we got you all the way up to installing stuff and getting Jupyter running and everything, uh, uh, we will move on to that. Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, might, somebody might have missed the point when they have several projects, each with a virtual environment, how to switch among them. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would make a virtual environment everywhere you need one. I would use a clean one every time. I, I use them like a tissue, you know, use it and throw it away, get a new one. Um, so, for example, in this, uh, I'm making a temp directory just for today's presentation, installing the stuff I need uh, directly in here, you know, in end. And at the end of the day, I'll just delete the whole temp directory, and I and I won't have to worry about anything. So yeah, if you know, if you're working on uh, make dir my project, you know, uh, cd my project, make a virtual environment there, use it there. Um, you could also just create one virtual environment that you'll use for everything. Uh, some users, if you're not doing much development, you know that might be a little simpler. Um, but for me, I think it's, it's it's really easy just to make one anytime you need one uh, and use it. Great. So now we're going to combine some of the skills we learned yesterday with uh, with this uh, virtual environment stuff, and we are going to add a few functions to our bash rc files yeah go ahead and ask questions anytime to our bash rc or zshrc files that way we can run all those commands with with one command uh you don't see the same bar in the jupyter notebook and this is a problem i've had during several presentations and the solution was never entirely clear um 
Yeah, so this menu bar up here sometimes in some circumstances doesn't show up. Uh, and yeah, I'm not totally sure. Yeah, no menu bar. Um, you don't strictly need the menu bar. Yeah, um, it's never happened on my system, so I'm not exactly sure what the problem is. But you don't strictly need it uh, because you can do most of the stuff from, from there. Um, yeah, you can go to new, uh, file, new notebook, and then, yeah, you want to use the virtual environment we just created. So you'll want to use ENB in there. Okay, yeah, so now we are going to... Uh, yes, we are going to make a change to our uh, either bash RC files or uh, ZSH RC files. Um, ZSH, the Z shell, is the new default for Mac, and it's nice. So I actually use ZSH, but in terms of functionality, it's, it's basically equivalent to bash, so that you can consider them as basically equivalent. Um, if your shell is bash, you're going to want to edit dot bash RC. If your shell is Z, you're going to want to edit dot zshrc. Um, so yes, let's do this real quick. Um, I'm going to open the the text editor I use most for quick stuff is Sublime. Uh, you can use whatever you want. Uh, there are many, and I'm going to open a file in Sublime. I'm in my home directory. Okay, I'm in an Apple, and in order to see hidden files, I have to hit Shift command period and now i can see all the hidden files this would be like ls a you want to see all the hidden files as well uh, and here i've got my zsh rc file um a good idea before doing anything the modifies one of these files is to to make a copy of it and i see i've already got a zsh uh, a ridge so i'm going to um, i'm going to make a new tab i'm going to change to my home directory and I am going to copy .zshrc to .zshrc underscore. I'm just going to go get it today's date or something. 24, 26, 29. Okay, so now I've got a perfect copy of what my uh, ZSH uh, file was. And if you're using bash RC, obviously uh, do that instead. Uh, and now I will. Uh, Open this with. Uh, oh yeah, that's good. So I'm going to open up. And yeah, so I've already got a venv make function that I use. Yeah, let's thanks Marcel. Uh, yeah, so I use venv make all the time, like I said, um, and so it's just basically all those commands, but it spits a little information out at the same point. Uh, but mine is a little bit different from this one. So in my uh, ZSHRC file here. I am going to copy uh, this venv make. Okay. And at the bottom of my ZSHRC file, I'm going to put that in. And I'm going to call it uh, CNS Venv Make just so it doesn't affect my other one. Uh, and again, these are just the same commands that we just talked about going through, uh, which Python 3 use the uh, create the environment, activate it, uh, install pip, uh, get Jupyter going, and create a kernel. Uh, so I'm going to save my Venv Make there. Uh, and the other one, uh, this is convenient venv activate, just because I get tired of typing source and bin activate all the time. So I've made a little function called venv activate that uh, does that for me. And this is actually already in my uh, in my uh, ZSHRC file, so I'm not going to paste that in. Uh, and for consistency, just so every command I can do with venv starts with venv, uh, you can just type deactivate from anywhere inside a virtual environment, and it'll get rid of it. But I just make a nice alias so I can use uh, venv commands for everything. Uh, so yeah, so I've got this uh, venv make and, and these two things copied into my ZSHRC file. I'm going to save that. 
And now I'm going to open a new terminal because your, your ZSHRC, your bash RC files only get loaded once when you start a new terminal. Uh, and you can use the same one. New, exactly. Yeah. So functions are awesome. If you if you've got a bunch of steps you have to do all the time, throw them into a function in your shell and it makes it super easy. So yeah, I mean, a new terminal, those should all be uh, loaded now. So I'm going to hit uh, type in Venv and then hit tab. And I can see that I've got Venv activate, Venv deactivate, and Venv make. Uh, yes, yeah, so you want to copy and paste all of that into the ZSHRC or the Bash RC, depending on which shell you're using. Uh, but I actually named mine uh, CNS uh, Venv make. So I'm just going to run this now. And uh, yeah. So preparing a virtual environment, 3.8.2 from user bin Python 3, installing pip. Jupiter and all that stuff. Oh, and I'm in my home directory. Uh, okay, I should really have made another a temporary directory first before I did this. But uh, cleanup's easy enough. It's just this uh, in my home directory. It's this env dir. Uh, I'm just going to delete that because I don't want it there. Um, and I'm going to CD to my desktop, make their uh, CNS Python, CD CNS Python, uh, CNS, then make. Okay, so now I'm on my desktop. I'm in CNS Python. I'm getting my virtual environment installed. Yeah, the installation takes a little while, but again, you only have to do this once, all the install. Afterwards, you just enter the virtual environment. Great, so yeah, in my virtual environment, users gram desktop CS Python env. So what was the command you just used for this install? Uh, I call my, my virtual environment creator venv underscore make. Uh, and I, you, know, you can call it whatever you want, uh, but for I didn't want it to interfere with my existing venv make, so I called it cns underscore venv underscore make. Uh, and it, that just activates that function we created. So we are in our virtual environment. So we've got that stuff installed. Now we want to uh, get ready for the next portion of this class. Uh, this is one of the commands. Yep. Uh, yeah. So now we want to get ready for the next portion of the class, which Shailesh will uh, will run. So we're going to clone uh, the repository that holds uh, actually holds this. Uh, uh, interactive notebook so you can you can download it directly so now yep in my uh directory here we've got our software uh and in the 2021 07 03 uh we're in 03 python and yes this python 101 is the uh notebook we will be using so let's go ahead and jupyter notebook uh Software events three Python. Oops. And I noticed there's a space in the file name, so we'll need to put uh, quotes around all of this. It's a quote at the end. Getting. Oh, phew. kernel not found. Pi three. Oh, okay. It wants a different kernel. Yeah, switch to ENV. We, you know, the, right. the environment we're using. The, that was the name of my virtual environment. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay, that's why it's looking for. It. Yeah, cool. that's why it was saved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So ENV uh, set the kernel, and now this is just that uh, all that stuff we just did. Uh, is in the first uh, non-interactive cell of the Jupyter Notebook. And then the next section of this tutorial, which will be interactive, uh, will start down here. Uh, so yeah. Uh, oh, sorry about being two steps behind. Uh, I can go back a little bit. Uh, yeah, let's, um, well, I'm just gonna do it all over again. So I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go to my home directory, uh, change to my desktop. 
I'm going to make dir temp. I'm going to remove dash RF temp. Again, very careful with RM dash RF. <laughs> you can do a lot of damage. <laughs> make dir temp, CD temp. Okay. And then I want to uh, get clone uh, this repository. Great. That's the command. Clone this repository with that command. Okay, let's take a look at our temperature here. I'm on my desktop and this temperature. Great, we downloaded that. Uh, let's go ahead and change directories into it. So into that two zero, whatever. And I'm gonna hit tab here, so I don't have to type uh, that long file name. Excuse me, and that's <laughs> CDS uh, tab, and then two uh, tab, and then O3 tab. So we can CD into it. Joe, you'll have to recreate your virtual environment in case you forget. Yeah, I, actually, I realized this is that I, I had them clone it before I did it before. So uh, yeah, exactly. So we've got that. Uh, we're, we're in the right place where the file is. Now we want to, um, you want to CNS uh, or event make. I want to CNS or event make. Yep, takes a little while to get all the software installed. Okay. Great, so we are in our virtual environment in ENV here, uh, as you can see. So then we just want to uh, Jupyter Notebook. Execute that. And yep, opens up a new uh, Jupyter Notebook, or I mean, the Jupyter Notebook in a new window. And we want to use uh, ENV, set the kernel, and uh, then you're, you're good to go moving on to the next. All right. So any questions or problems before we uh, move on to the next section here? All right, I don't know if we want to take a short break or uh, if we want to roll right in to you, Sharj. Uh, so we could have a five minute break, but I'm going to ask everyone, all the participants, if they have this Jupyter notebook that Joe just demonstrated, do you have it running on your computers? Because the next one hour, one, one hour, 15 minutes, we are going to be uh, working entirely within this Jupyter notebook. So it probably won't make much sense if it's not working. So for those whom where it's working, you're free to take a five minute break. And the others, if anybody's having an issue, please do mention in the chat and we'll try to help you with it. Um, do you, uh, do one of you want to share your screen and put a timer on for five minutes so folks know how much time they have to get tea, coffee, stretch their legs or finish setting up their Virtual environments. Okay, five minutes. Are uh, you going to do it the Python way? Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll be back in a few minutes here. I need a drink and a break. Yeah, in the meantime, if, if uh, folks have had any issues setting up their virtual environments, please uh, let us know in the chat and we can help you set those up. And if you have it all set up, you can try setting up another one, playing around with it and so on, because remember, it's as Joe said, uh, think of them as tissues, use them, delete them, set up a new one, right there. They are very, very uh, disposable. And in the worst case, if for whatever reasons, you're not able to run the Jupyter Notebook on your system right now for this session, if that is the case, do let us know and we'll try to um, send you a Google Collab link where you could do the same thing online. Uh, because probably the next part of this tutorial is not going to be of much use if you can't follow along interactively.
that seemed like a pretty short break. Uh, is everyone back? Are we ready for the next session? Okay, let's wait a minute more. All right, let's start with the second bit of this tutorial. Um, so again, just asking one last time uh, that just to make sure everybody has this Jupyter notebook named Python 101 loaded up and uh, you're able to see these same contents, right? So if you have any problems there, please do let us know. As a backup, I'm pasting this link, which is the same Jupyter notebook uploaded on Google Colab you would be able to copy, download from there as well, or even just work directly on Google Colab. Uh, so yeah, ideally just work locally with the Jupyter Notebook as Joe was showing, showing you. If that doesn't work for whatever reasons, please do click on that link and you can follow the rest of the session on, uh, on that Google uh, Jupyter Notebook. All right, so, um, so this next bit we're going to, it's going to be for like an hour, hour 15 minutes. We are going to cover 12, let's say, very basic uh, basic concepts in Python. So thanks for responding to the, the couple of questions we had put up on the poll. So we see that um, the majority seem to be people who know some, I mean, everybody seems to be, uh, seems to be, uh, have some programming experience either in Python or in a different language, but the majority seem to be, let's say new to, Python or don't have any experience with Python. And this session certainly is, let's say, more targeted towards them. So the, uh, so the few people that we have who are, let's say, more comfortable with Python, this might be a bit too easy for you. Uh, it could be a refresher course, or you could just, um, yeah, just take a look and see if uh, uh, you can suggest any improvements or anything in what I'm doing here. All right. So we have 12 topics here. I'm going to spend like roughly five minutes on each of them. And the way I would be using that time is, so for each of these topics, uh, you will see a bunch of empty cells there. That's where I'm going to, let's say, put in my sample uh, commands and show you sample outputs. Uh, if you are fast at typing or uh, you're really keen to, let's say, uh, follow along, uh, you're, you're enc encouraged to repeat the same statements that I'm doing. If not, if rather you wish to sort of observe and understand, that's also perfectly fine because at the end of each of these sections, there's a small exercise where you can sort of test yourself to see if you've understood what's happening. So I'm going to spend like a couple of minutes doing these examples and then give you a minute, minute and a half to work out these small, very small exercises by yourself. And at the end of that time, I'll, uh, I'll put the, co uh, the sample solution here myself so that you can check, compare and see if uh, you did something wrong, something different, whatever, okay? Uh, this in session, I do intend to go slow. So at any point, if I'm accidentally speeding up, please do let me know, okay? Do use the chat. So ideally these sessions are better held uh, like uh, in, in, in a physical classroom where we can see and um, clear out everyone's doubts, but that's not the case with COVID these days. So please do, I, I encourage you to use the chat, the chat window extensively. Uh, yeah, so do remember this session is completely targeted at beginners, a very early stage users of Python. So no questions are 
let's say too trivial or too uh, basic, uh, feel free to ask us anything here. All right. Uh, so I guess enough talking, and now let's start uh, dive into the uh, into actually doing some Python coding here. So um, as you can see, the first first command here is print. Now let's following tradition of uh, having this convention of starting a programming language using a print and hello world, we do the same here. So if you want to print anything on the screen in Python, you basically write print hello, uh, within brackets, hello world. So some people might, uh, you might see on forums and some text, old textbooks that the print statement used to look like this without the brackets, but that was in Python version two. That's no longer possible. You are Suppose you use it like a proper function that is print, you have these brackets and then within that you put in hello world. And now when I run this notebook, uh, also I, I did notice that a few of you are, uh, let's say pretty new to Jupyter Notebooks itself. So uh, basically these boxes are called cells. You type in the command inside these cells and to run it, you can either press this run button on top here or just press control enter. All right. So every time I run, you will see that the counter here increases. It's basically just showing this was the second cell that was run. This is the third cell that was run, so on. It helps you sort of keep a track of the sequence in which these uh, statements were executed. All right. So print is the very most basic thing that you would do in Python. And it's as simple as that. Uh, mo moving on, um, apart from print, let's, uh, let me also introduce you to comments. Uh, so since all of you have some programming experience, you know that comments are basically uh, statements that you put in not for being displayed on the screen, but rather for uh, making notes as a developer itself for you yourself later or your teammates who might sort of go through your code years later to rectify stuff. And once the code becomes starts becoming pretty long, uh, it becomes difficult to identify what part of the code does what. So it's always nice to have uh, detailed comments wherever you think it would be useful. So this is how you would add a comment in Python. All right. Um, and then versus the print, which would, this would go on the screen. And now when I run this, you would see that the print statement actually printed on the screen, whereas the first one, it's basically ignored by the compiler, uh, by the interpreter, and it's just there for your own reference in the future. All right, so a comment in Python is preceded by a hash symbol, and basically anything that goes after that on that same line is ignored. If I removed this comment from here and rather I placed it there, that is I have a print, and then I put a hash, basically it would execute everything till the hash and after that, it will basically ignore. After that, it considers the rest, all the contents on this line is a comment. So running it again, basically you see the print, but not the rest of it. All right, I'm gonna give, now since this was very trivial, I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds, 40 seconds to try this out yourself, and then we'll move on to the next bit. Just as an extra item, um, so this, the hash symbol is used for adding single line comments, uh, but, and if you wanted to add something long, something long line one, and ideally you don't exceed 80 characters on, on the same line. I forget if it's 80 or 79, but yeah, I think it's 80, yeah, 80, zero to 79, 80 characters on the same line, ideally. Uh, not that, I mean, Python would not put this restriction, but just that on screen, it's more readable if you don't exceed th those many characters per line. Uh, so if you had something longer, continue here, line two and so on. So you could do use as many of these single line comments as necessary, or 
you have the option of replacing that with a multi-line comment, which is triple double quotes and this, and then you no longer need that there. Okay, you do this. Uh, oh, one second. Okay, that's, yeah. So, okay, maybe we'll go back to this when you're doing uh, blocks. Um, yeah. Okay, we, we'll go back to this when using blocks, but basically this is this would be used for multi-line comments. I wonder if we get the same if we are doing uh, inside a Jupyter, uh, inside our regular console. Okay, I never tried that. <laughs> All right, anyway, so maybe just ignore that bit for now and uh, Let's move on with the exercise. So here is, let's say a sample of what you would do. All right, uh, any questions? So uh, ignore the multi, uh, multi line comment bit, we'll come back to that. And uh, so just try a print statement and a single line comment. Okay, I suppose I was straightforward enough. So I'm gonna skip that, uh, I'm sorry, move on to the next bit. So uh, since you all use programming languages, I'm, uh, let's say, for example, in C or something, if you needed to create a variable, va variable basically being a container for holding a value, you would have done something like int num equal to phi or something like that. So that is, you would have sort of specified the data type that you intend uh, for this variable to be so that it can hold that kind of a value. So if this was supposed to hold a, 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 an integer value, you would have an int. If it was to store a decimal value, you might, you might have a, placed a float. Uh, in Python, um, just to make things much simpler, you really don't have to bother about the data type. You can just start using the variable as you want. So for example, you can have num equal to 10 and Python would internally take care of the fact that this is, this is a number. All right, um, just checking the chat. Right, okay. So uh, that this would be a number. So for example, let's say I want to create a variable that would hold my first name. I'll do that. Uh, another variable for holding my last name. So when you want to hold text strings, you basically enclose them within double quotes like that. And or double, uh, sorry, yeah, you either use double quotes or single quotes. The only thing is it, it should basically match. You can't sort of mix them up to have a double quote here and a single quote there. So anything within double quotes would be considered a, a complete string. Anything within these pair of single quotes would be considered a string. Uh, so basically I have two strings there. And let's say I want to add a variable, a, a number called age 34. Now, when I, uh, I execute this, I basically I am getting I, uh, I basically set these values into those variables. So now I can do print first name, um, let's say print age, and I get those printed on the screen. Another way uh, for setting these values is you don't really have to split them up into multiple lines. You could also do this, first name, last name, like that. In this case, the first value gets assigned to the first variable, the second value gets assigned to the second variable, and then you still have the same, right? Um, so that's there. And uh, let's just see about doing, let's say a bit of uh, math operations on these. So let's say we have a variable X and we have set the value to 10, the another value to five. Um, I want to calculate the result of adding these two up. So result X plus Y and I print the result. So you have two variables, you add them up, put it into a third variable and you print the result. Now, the same thing, let's say instead of Y equal to the number phi, I put it as string phi. Uh, any ideas what would happen in this case? 
So in this particular case, this would actually not run because you're trying to add a string with an, in, uh, sorry, a number with a string and uh, Python gives you that error that it's unsupported operands. You are trying to add an integer and a string. So what you would actually have to do is convert this Y into a integer. So you would sort of cast this into an integer and then yeah, you have the output, right? So just like this, uh, so here we basically converting a string, which is holding a numeric value into a integer. Uh, this, you could do this, the reverse thing, which is, uh, let's say you have, a, um, you want to say five plus apples, right? You won't be allowed to do this because you're trying to add an integer and a string, but if you wanted, you could do five apples. So you're basically converting the integer this time, doing the reverse of what you did there. You have the number, you're converting it into a string and then concatenating these two strings. So five apples, right? Okay, so uh, the exercise is a bit more further down, but since we have been pr uh, printing these variables over here, uh, I'm going to, let's say, show you a few different ways in which you can print, uh, print uh, variable, uh, variable values on this, uh, in, in Python. So let's say uh, we already have a variable called first name. So I could do hello, I'll put a space there and add first name and it will print hello Shailesh. I can even do multiple of these. So hello, uh, first name, um, full stop, age is then plus age. I made the mistake of not converting it. So plus age, and I forgot the last bracket this time, right? Um, all right, so just to show if I don't have the string here, I'm going to have the error. So I would need to convert that number into a string, right? Now there are several ways to print. This is not the most ideal way to do it. It's like you have to, you're keeping track of all the, the double quotes, opening, closing, uh, whenever there's a variable having a plus before it, plus after that, so that you sort of join it with the next bit of the string. And this is certainly very cumbersome. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to show you a few ways of how you can do the same thing in Python and then sort of in the final bit, show you what's the most recommended way of doing this at this moment. All right, so the first bit is what, um, like that, which is basically you put instead of the plus, uh, concatenation, you're just sending it as separate arguments. So you're saying print hello, then print first name, then print last name, then print your ages, comma, age, then the full stop, all right? So that's one way of doing it, uh, but certainly not the most uh, easy way of doing it. The other way that you might see on some forums and stuff is print hello, percentage S. Now percentage S is like a placeholder for a string. So I'm going to say hello, first name, last name, your age is percentage s. All right. Uh, right. And then I do first name, last name, age. First name, last name, age. Uh, I've missed something there. Print. Uh, I've not closed the double quotes. The same thing there. So basically the first string placeholder is replaced by the first variable after this percentage symbol. Uh, the second string is replaced by the second one and the last one, which is age is replaced by the last one. So basically the order in which you're specifying the parameters here is uh, the order in which they're going to be substituted in the first part. Now, this is also not ideal because uh, yeah, you're sort of keeping track, if you remove one variable from here, you have to make sure that you change it there, the order has to be maintained and so on. 
The other one, which used to be somewhat more common uh, in Python 2, was using the string format one. So in this case, it would be hello, first name, last name. So I'm just keeping like empty slots for these values to be put in. And your age is something else there. And then at the end of this string, which is basically from this double quotes to this double quotes, I'm writing format. And now I specify the variables that are being substituted in. Okay, so you get the same thing there. In this kind of a syntax, you also had the option of changing things around. So even though it's first name, last name, age, I could change the way in the, these were substituted around. I could have them the, so remember uh, Python uses in uh, numbering indexing from zero. So this is zero, one, two, right? Argument zero, argument one, argument two. Uh, what I'm saying is put the second argument here, the first argument there, and let's say keeping the index there itself. So now you see that the order of substitution gets uh, interchanged between these two. By default, it will just take it in the order it's provided, but you have the option of changing things around. Now, since uh, Python version three, specifically by version 3.6, there is this new kind of printing print uh, syntax that you can use, which are called as F strings, formatted string literals. And this is let's say the preferred recommended way of doing this. So the same thing that you're seeing me do above, I would now do it as print. Okay, notice that I'm putting an F here. And then I start the double quotes, okay? And within these double quotes, I write, hello, first name, last name, your age is, that's it. So no substitution placeholders and all that stuff. I'm putting the variables where I want their value to be displayed. And I get this, so I think, Comparing these different ways, you would appreciate this is much more neater uh, and more elegant than all these other things where you had the placeholders and then the variables being specified later. This, the variable is being placed at the very uh, location that you want, uh, want it to be printed, right? So this is what I'm going to be using in the rest of this tutorial and I would strongly advise all of you to follow this as well. All right, so time for the small exercise. Uh, create a variable named day and have the value Tuesday, the string Tuesday in, uh, placed into it. Create another variable date, which will just be a number 29, today's date. And now uh, print both of these in a sentence using F strings. I'll give you around a minute to do this and then we'll move on to the third part. Uh, so uh, answering Michael's question uh, about double quotes versus single quotes in Python. Yes, uh, both of them would be considered as uh, strings. So you can have uh, my string equal to A, B, C, D, E. And then you can, so if you want to check the, the string type, uh, sorry, the type of your variable, you can print type the variable name. So let's do this. Um, twice, once with double quotes. And you would see that in both cases, it's a string to Python. That answers your question, Michael.
Right. So um, I guess most of you have done this by now. So it's going to be something like day equal to Tuesday, date equal to 29. And then printing this F double quotes within double quotes. Uh, today is day and the date is date. And you get an output such as that. Right? No problem still here, right? Uh, I see nothing specific on the chat, so I'll move on to part three. If you want me to wait a minute more, do let me know, um, no rush. All right, so moving on to strings. So in the previous section, we did this a few times. That is, print, we set first name to, uh, to, let's say in this case, my name, I printed it. Now there's a bunch of stuff I can do on strings. So for example, I want to see the number of characters in this string. So I can use len, which is basically short form for length, first name, and it prints eight. I can try to print just the first character using first name zero. Remember Python uses indexing starting from zero. I can print the very last character. So if I did not know what's the size, uh, if it was let's say an arbitrary input, uh, but I just want to see the very last, I can do first name minus one, which is basically just numbering from the end and going backward, uh, reverse. So it's it just basically goes here and then it gives you the last one, all right? Uh, what you cannot do is try to change a particular alphabet. So uh, a particular character <clears throat> within a string. So I can't change that to uh, change the first character to Q, I'll get an error. String does not support item assignment, okay? So if you had to the, do this in real life, it's uh, let's say not that difficult, but you would convert strings into what is called as a list and then you would be able to handle uh, access and modify each individual character. Um, but we're gonna leave that for now. Uh, the other stuff that you can do is, let's say you can print first name and then try uh, putting it all in lowercase or equally you could put it all into uppercase. So here the first alphabet, which was earlier capitalized is now in small, the second print prints everything in capitals, okay? So there are lots of, let's say, such built-in functions. Uh, and the way to sort of, um, I mean, when you're starting off, you certainly don't know, you would, uh, you would be, these things would be new to you. So one of the ways of figuring it out is, um, for example, I told you that the variable type here is, if you do type the variable name, you get string. So Python has inbuilt fun, uh, help function. So you can use help and then in the brackets put the command or the data type that you want help about. Execute this and you would see a, a pretty detailed info about the different attributes, the different methods, so on. I, I won't uh, spend much time on this right now, but sort of quickly take you to, let's say the part that we used so for example, there's a function called upper. <clears throat> it uh, makes everything into uppercase. Similarly, there was a function called, um, where was the one? Lower. Hmm. That's interesting, where did that go? All right. Oh, okay, yeah, right there, lower. Um, and maybe let's try one more. Um, so one, so one other that I use quite op uh, quite often is starts with, and corresponding to that, there's one called ends with as well. Um, right. So for example, you can do first name dot starts. Okay. So. The one other handy feature is uh, you can write the variable name, put a dot and then press tab for auto completion and it will show you all the different 
uh, attributes or methods that that is available to be used with this variable. So if you, when I'm using the tab, you see that there is the upper, which we use, there's the lower. Uh, if you want more detailed information on what these does, you should use the help function. Uh, alternatively, always you can Google it. One of the, I mean, the one of the biggest advantages of using Python is the vast com uh, community out there. Almost every single question that you're bound to happen, have, especially as a beginner in Python, is bound to have been responded to multiple times, uh, especially on websites like Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow, right? So uh, yes, always keep in mind that your answers are always available on the, on the internet and already responded by somebody previously. So it's just a matter of searching and sort of phrasing your question properly there. So in this case, I'm going to go with starts with, right? Uh, and I'm going to check, does my name start with SH, let's say in this case. Uh, not sure what you're expecting, but the output is going to be false. And the reason is Python is case sensitive, both for values and variables. So for example, a variable with the name first name is different from a variable first name, first name, all these would be different. And naturally the same certainly holds for uh, the values as well. So my name does not start with small s h in, 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 our, in this example, but rather it's with capital S. So if I change it to capital S, it's, uh, it, it works. Um, so on similar line, like starts with, you also have this option called ends with. So you can also just write a first few of the characters and press tab and you will have auto completion there. And I can check, does it end with, I don't know, uh, A. No, it does not because it ends with H, right? So one of the places I use this pretty frequently is to see if, uh, to identify file types. So if I have a file name here um, and then I check, does it end with a PNG, for example? So it's one of the ways for sort of figuring out if, or filtering out specific file types, right? Uh, okay, time to go move on to the next exercise. So create, two variables named first name and last name with values corresponding to your own name. Create a third variable called full name by joining the previous two. Remember to add a space between them. And now just print that in complete capitals and also print the length, total number of characters in your full name. I'll give you a minute again here and let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to keep this bit here just for, okay, maybe. Um, yeah, keep the solution here because you have the questions in your own notebook. So. Uh, thanks, Joe, Marcel, Ankur, for responding to these queries on chat. Um, yeah, certainly makes it easier for me.
have. I forgot Zoom chat does not allow copy paste. Um, so I'm gonna have to write that again. I used I think for. All right, uh, so let's move on to the next bit. Oh, in first, there's, uh, let's say a sample solution here. So first name equal to, let's say something, last name. Uh, full name equal to first name. Okay, so even for variables, you can use the autocomplete option. So first name plus last name. Um, if I print full name at this point, you would see that it lacks the space between the two. And for that reason, I would add a space like this. Now there are, let's say more neater ways of doing this, but uh, at this point, this, this is the, let's say the most simplest solution. Um, so I'm going to write, I'm going to make it an F string. And um, my name is full name and consists of full name characters, right? Um, I'll go till here, we, can we move on? Okay, so let's move on to lists. So lists are uh, used for uh, having a collection of items and you can mix around the data types. Uh, but let's say to, to give you more context, let's say you have um, five, five people and naturally they have five names. Now, if you wanted to store each of their names, you would have, let's say first name one, first name two, first name three, first name four, first name five and so on, right? And that's not very convenient. Let's say if you're having a class of 50 students or uh, 100 employees in an office and so on. So rather, if you want to, let's say, just pick up all these different uh, data and put it into a single entity, list is one such option that you have. So as an example, let's go with, let's say, fruits. So I want, I'm creating a collection of multiple strings, in this case, names of fruits. So let's say, or oranges. Uh, and mangoes, all right? So right now I have a variable, which is if I check the type, all right? If I check the type, it's of type list and it's basically holding these three values. I can check the size of this list. That is the number of entries in this list right now by doing length fruits, similar to what you were doing for strings, right? And uh, if you print it right now, you just basically see the same thing that you specified there. But uh, I can add more things. So append naturally means adding to the end. So I could add something like let's say grapes. And now if I check fruits, I get the, the previous three plus there's this fourth, fourth item that I've just added. If I wanted to add multiple items, in one go, uh, let's say pears and peaches. You would imagine you would do it like this, that is append pears and peaches, just like we did for grapes. But when you try this, you get an error message saying that append can take exactly one argument, but you have given two. So as you see here, we just gave it one argument, but in this case, we have given it two, which doesn't work. So the way to do it would be fruits.extend. So not append, append is for adding a single item to the end of the list. Extend adds one or more multiple items at the end. So what you do is extend and then inside a list again, now you can say pears and peaches, all right? 
And now if you print fruits, you have apples, oranges, mangoes, grapes from this append statement. And from this extent, you have now added these two. Now, those who are curious might wonder what would happen if I used this inside the append statement, okay? That is, instead of just that, I put the whole thing inside a square bracket. Now it's basically become one argument, right? So we no longer have this problem. It takes exactly one argument, and now this is exactly a single argument, which is a list containing two items. So if you try to do this, you don't get an error, but the output becomes something not what you expected. So you have whatever you came up with last time. And now basically the, the newest item entry is not just the name of the fruit, but it's actually a list itself. So what you're doing is fruit append the, the entire list. And that's not what you wanted. You wanted basically it to be one more, let's say a string being added to this fruits list, right? Uh, so basically append is used for adding one item at a time. Extend can be used for adding one or more items in one go. As you can see, list does not have to contain of the same data type, right? So you have string, 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 and list. Just to drive home that point further, I could do fruits.append10, which is now a number. So it's basically a bunch of strings, a list, and a number, right? So you can mix around the data types uh, inside a list. All right, um, so now you have seen how you can add items to it. Uh, okay, oh, maybe one other thing that I should, should just point out since we're already here is right now, if I check the length, it will show me eight. Now I'm not sure if that's what you would have uh, expected yourself, but it's like one, two, three, four, five, six. This whole thing will be considered as one entry because it's a list, right? So seven and eight. It does not go inside and count the individual elements, right? So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All right. Now, if you wanted to print specific entries from this list, you can do that. It's basically returned the very first item. Like we did for strings, you can use it for printing the very last item or any specific index in between, right? Um, so now that we have seen how we can add and access individual entries, let's go on to deleting items from um, uh, de deleting items from this list. So there are, let's say, a few ways you can do this. Uh, the first is using the del keyword. Okay, so you can do del fruits minus one. Now you know at minus one is ten. So you're basically asking the list to delete the last element here and let's print it immediately afterward just to see what happens, okay? So we ran del delete the fruits, the last element, and now we see that it's gone off, right? Let's run this once more. And now you see the next one has gone out, right? So the first time we ran that statement, it removed the last element the second time we're running it, it's again removing the last element, just that the last item has now changed it. Now it's this list item that we had added. So using del is one way of doing it, but rather if you wanted to remove, let's say a particular item from this uh, list, let's say not based on the index, you don't know where the items are located, but you want to remove grapes from this list, then you can use fruits.remove, remember fruits is your list, right? Fruits is your list. So it's basically list.remove and I'm going to remove grapes from there. And let me print it, right? So you see you have all the, all the other uh, fruits coming back but grapes has been removed from this list. So this is one way of doing it uh, I wonder what happens when you try to remove something which does not exist. So right now there are no grapes remaining in, in this list. If you try to remove it now, it will say X not in the list. 
the item that you have asked for, to be removed does not exist in the list, right? Um, so, okay, we have seen remove, we have seen delete. Um, okay, there's also the op one more option is, so you have fruits, okay? Now, what you can do is fruits.pop. What it does is it removes the last item of the list, but it gives you this last item in a variable. So for example, item equal to fruits.pop, you can print item. And then let's again print the entire fruits. So this was your fruits list. You popped the last item. So by default, this pops the very last item from there. You, you are able to print the item that was popped, which is peaches, which you now have as a return value into item. And when you print fruits again, you see that this is the list now and peaches does not exist there. Okay. Uh, alternatively, I'm gonna add a few more cells. Alternatively, what you can do is you can specify the specific item uh, or the, the sp a specific index that you want popped. So that's zero, one, two, three. If I want to remove the second item, I can do that. And this time oranges has been popped out and that's the remaining list. All right, um, so, um, okay. I'm going to show you how you can add something. Uh, so you saw how you can do append and extend, but let's say you want to add not at the very end, but at a specific location. Let's say I accidentally deleted oranges. Now I want to put it back. What I can do is fruits.insert, insert at location one. So that is zero, sorry, zero. And then here one, I would like to have oranges. Okay. So now index one is oranges. Previously it was mangoes. Now index one is oranges and basically rest everything got shifted one index up. Um, so in the chat, I'm happy to see that we are having some people impressed with some of the functionalities in Python and hope it encourages them to sort of take this up. All right, so that's that. And um, maybe a few let's say final stuff to show you what things can, uh, what you can do. So if I just print fruits, this is what I get. If I do fruits into two, I'm basically getting double of everything I had, basically it just repeats the list at the end. So it's like fruits one time, adding the fruits, the whole list again at the end, the second time. Okay, so that's that. Uh, similarly, you can add add lists as well. So let's say you had fruits. Now I can add another list to this, which is let's say um, cats and dogs or something, which doesn't make really sense here, but I can do that. And basically you're adding a list with another list. Okay. Uh, just note that when I'm doing this, it does not update this list itself, right? Because I've just used it for the print statement. If I wanted it to be updated, I would have done something like fruits equals to fruits plus cats and dogs. And then I basically done the edit, the joining of the list and then stored it back inside that variable. And then you have, you have it uh, stored, let's say, for all subsequent commands. Right, uh, so there were a bunch of commands there. If you have any questions with that, do let me know in the chat, but in the, if not, in the meantime, you can try out this exercise. Um, and yeah, in a minute or two, I'll show you a sample solution to it.
uh, would you like more time or I can move on to a sample solution of how to do this? Okay, since I don't see any protests, I'm going to move on to the solution. So, um, right, okay. So the first part was create a list named superheroes with values Batman and Superman. You have that there. Uh, then uh, you have add a, to, uh, to the end of this list Wonder Woman. So you would use the append statement. Then you want to add two items using a single statement. So it would be the extend. So extend, and then you put the list and put the two items inside. Finally, you want to remove the entry uh, named Batman. And the very final thing is you remove the very first element from this list. So pop, but with an index. If you don't give an index here, it will remove the last item. Since I want to remove specifically the first item, I'm going to do zero, all right? So if I run this, you see that, yes, initially I have just Batman and Superman. Then I added Wonder Woman using the append statement, then added Thor and Iron Man using the extend statement. And then we removed Batman by doing dot remove Batman. So that's gone out. Now the first uh, first entry is Superman because Batman is has been kicked out. Um, and now if you want to remove the first element without knowing what it is, so in the previous case, we specifically wanted to remove Batman and he just happened to be at the first place. It he could have been anywhere. But in this last statement, we specifically want to get rid of the first element in the list, which is it, it just happens to be Superman. And now Wonder Woman has index zero. She is in the first place. All right, so with that, let's move on to dictionaries. So dictionaries are a data type similar, um, yeah. So it's it can also hold a collection of items, but in this case, it just, it's not just a list of let's say a bunch of things, but it's like a, a, a dictionary, uh, a key value pair. So like in a phone book, you have a name and you have a number. So similar to that dictionaries um, will have a key value a uh, key value pair. So if you remember when we were doing the list, we had started doing something like that. It was square brackets. In the case of a dict, it's going to be curly braces. All right. And so as an example, let me make a dictionary called contacts. Okay, right now it's an empty dictionary, but I could have it initialized with, let's say, names and email addresses. So a, at, let's say, at b.com and adding anchor um, c at d.com, something like that. All right. So right now I have a dictionary called contact. If I print it, I basically just see the same thing. Not super useful, but um, right now, let's say if I say in contacts, I want specifically the key named Shailesh then it will return me the value associated with that key, okay? Um, what you cannot do is say, give me the first item or something which you were doing in list because zero is not a key in this dictionary at this moment, right? So you have to give one of the keys that you have set in there. So for example, the same thing, you can't do A, B, C, D, E because that's not a key that exists, but yes, you can do something that you have entered there and you will get the value for it. Now, if I want to add a new entry, so I already had me and Ankur in there. Let's say I wanted to add Joe's email address. So I would do e at .com, something like that. And now if I print contacts, I have my earlier entries plus Joe, right? But if I, let's say, uh, used a key that was already existing and I did it to, I don't know, something like um, not available or something, something like that. Then instead of adding something new, it basically updates that val the value associated with that key. Okay. So you can create an empty dictionary or you can initialize it with values like we have done here. You can add new keys key value pairs to the dictionary by doing something like that. 
And uh, if you want to see the list of all the people whose entries are available in this dictionary at this point, you would do something like contacts.keys. And you see that it's me and Kurinjo. But rather, if you were just interested in, let's say, making a list of all the available email addresses, not really care, just, you're just, let's say, creating a mailing list. You don't care who the emails belong to. Uh, you would just do something like contacts or values, and you have basically a list of all the the email addresses. You have lost all the information that what belongs to whom, but uh, which email address belongs to whom. But yeah, you have the the collection of all emails that are there. Um, I mean, another re related item is doing contacts or items, which basically gives you a list of tuples. Uh, something that I won't go into. To, into today's session just for the sake of time. Um, but there are, let's say, data types called sets and tuples. Um, and uh, yeah, probably that's something that you could check up later on or if we have a more detailed Python session some, someday in the future. Uh, but here basically it gives you a tuple of the name and the email, name and the email, name and the email. Okay. Um, so we have a few more cells there. So. Contacts currently consists of this. If uh, I want to remove a particular entry, uh, I can do the same thing as we did for list using pop. So I can do contacts.pop. Um, remember it's case sensitive, so I can't use capital S here. I have to use small s. And then I can print the value and I can print contacts. And basically the not available is was the value that was associated with my name, which got popped out. And now the contacts just cons consists of Ankur and Joe. So uh, my value was sort of popped out. I got the value in this variable, but it's no longer a part of the original dictionary itself. Uh, the uh, another way of removing a particular key without let's say retrieving it inside a variable would be to use the delete keyword, the del keyword, like we did for less uh, list. And I can do delete contacts encore. And then if I do print, oh, sorry. So I run that and then, yeah. So encore also has been taken off that dictionary and now it just consists of Joe. All right, so that was, let's say a very brief intro into dictionaries, there are a lot more uses and different ways in which you can um, make use of lists, lists and dictionaries. But uh, the intention today was to just to give you a, let's say a feel of these various aspects of Python. Okay, so a small exercise coming up. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to go through this and then I'll show you a sample solution. Uh, on the chat, can you let me know if I'm going too slow for you or I can speed it up a little bit? Because I see uh, on the time front, I'm doing it on a bit on the slower side. Um, so if I can speed up a bit, do let me know. Okay, um, anyone who wants me to continue at the same pace or, I mean, what's important is that everyone fo follows along well, um, doesn't have any doubts after of whatever is being shown. So, um, okay, I'm going to speed, speed up a little bit, but if it's too fast or if there are any queries, again, the chat window is always accessible, please do uh, pour in with your questions there. Okay. Um, all right, so I show you a, let's say sample solution to what we can do here. It's set up. Ah. 
That's the first bird. Oh, all right, uh, I'm gonna zoom out a bit so that you can. Okay. You could potentially also switch to full screen and get rid of the menu and the toolbar, for example, if you don't. Um, so the toggle header and toggle toolbar. Okay, right. Yeah. I guess that's as compact as it gets, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay, so starting with the explanation for the solution, uh, part A, create a dictionary called countries with keys, France and England, and their corresponding values for uh, Paris and London. So you can make out that it's country and capitals basically. Um, so if you, okay, I'm gonna print that late. Okay, maybe I should just print it right away. So at this point, if you print it, you basically just have that there. Uh, next part B, add a new key value pair. So you basically have the dictionary and in square brackets add the new key and the value. So Wakanda, the capital is golden city. So you print after that, you see that apart from France and England, you have this third entry. Part C, print all the, uh, okay, so this was C and this was D. This is E, F, right. right. So after that, print the list of all the countries. So for that, you would do countries.keys. Uh, print all the capitals. You basically do countries.values. So here you have France, England, Wakanda as the, the countries, Paris, London, Golden City as the, the capitals, as the values in this dictionary. Now, if you want to uh, change a specific entry, you'll use countries, specify the key that, that you wish to have, uh, alter, and then you put in the new value there. This basically overwrites the old value of Golden City. And now if you print it, you will see that Wakanda instead of Golden City, it's now Birninzana, or however you call it. The very last thing we do is we delete this uh, and, uh, this key value pair with the key equal to Wakanda. So delete countries Wakanda, and you have that taken off. You're just back to where you started. All right, okay, so let's move on to conditions and conditional statements in Python. Um, if you want me to zoom back in, uh, let me know if the font size is too small at this point. Uh, if not, I'll just continue like this, okay? So you, we did lots of stuff like these, x equal to one, x equal to five, so on, right? This is when you're trying to assign a value into a variable. Now, if you, use that same equal to sign double, then it's no longer assignment, but it's more of the equality operator. So x equal to equal to phi, you will get, um, let's zoom in a little bit, okay. Yeah, if you do x equal to equal to phi, what you get is a comparison operator. Is x equal to equal to phi? Now here I had set the value phi, therefore yes, phi is equal to equal to phi and it's true. But for a moment, if I switched it to x equal to one, I tried the statement again. Now it says it's false, okay? So that's the equal to operator. Similarly, you have the, the not equal to operator, which would be false because one is not equal to five. Uh, sorry, which would be true now because it's basically the negation of what you were doing before. One equal to five is false. So not equal to is basically true, right? One is not equal to five, which is, True. Uh, then you have all the other remaining operators that you're used to, like less than, greater than, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to, um, the modulo operator, and so on. We'll use a few of those in the in the exercises that come up ahead. Okay. So I mean, just as one is x less than five. 
true because one is less than five, right? Um, so let's try a small, um, okay, so, okay, these were, let's say, comparisons, condition uh, operators. Now you have, you, I, I guess we're all, uh, let's say, familiar with the if statement, which is used for testing a condition and doing so, something based on the result. So if X is less, um, okay, let me say X modulo two, that is after division by two, what's the remainder? If X mod two is equal to zero, notice this, uh, colon here, that's very important here. So unlike uh, C and everyone, you don't need to have brackets, even though I don't think it's a problem if you do keep it. Uh, but yes, what you don't have is you don't have these braces, okay? So Python, now this is going to be very important for most of the subsequent sections. Python does not uh, distinguish blocks based on these kinds of braces. It does it based on the level of indentation, okay? Well, what I mean by indentation is, for example, x mod mod two equal to zero. Whatever is a should come up within this if should be indented here. Okay, so I can write print. Um, I don't know, here, and then I can say print even number, something like that. Okay, so you would notice that in in for example in Jupyter notebook. The fact that I used if I pressed enter, it already gave me the indentation to the right. The cursor did not go there. It did not go back here, but rather it went there because it knows that whatever follows the if should be indented within it. So I did that. And now once I'm done with the if statement, then I have to make sure that I go out. The way the way that I signal that the if, state, if block has term, is finished, is by going back to the original level of intent, okay? Now this indentation, you can do it in multiple ways. I am used to using tab, okay? I use tab. You can use spaces. The only thing you need to remember is to use the same number of spaces. So you can't have something like this and this at different levels, right? You get an indentation error. You, If you keep it at the same level, it's fine, okay? So remember that indentation is super important in Python. That is what uh, makes Python understand what how our blocks are being organized. And you have the option of choosing how you indent it. Uh, I guess some, some of it goes down to personal preference. Um, I personally prefer tabs, uh, tabs consisting of four spaces. Um, I think that's probably the default in Jupyter Notebooks as well. And most of your fancy, our fancy editors, they have options for specifying what a tab should be and what the indentation should consist of. Should it consist of a tab or a bunch of four spaces and so on. Um, yes, as Ankur has pointed out, do not mix spaces and tabs, right? Okay, so in this particular case, uh, I'm just going to initialize X here just so that we have it nearby. Um, and I'm going to add just one more sentence to make things appear, right? So X is one. So when I'm checking the condition, is it equal to equal to zero? The condition is false. So we don't go in there and it just goes out of the if and prints what's remaining. So it prints there. But instead, if I printed X equal to two, which is the even number, the condition is true. It goes in prints here, prints even number, then it prints the whatever it was following the if statement, which is there. All right. Um, now, if statement certainly has, uh, so uh, extensions of the if statement, which is you don't just do something if the condition is true, but if the condition is false. So similarly, after else, you also need the colon, and then you can print, let's say, odd number. I'm just gonna remove that extra print there just to make it more concise. Um, right. And now if I do it, I get even number there, but if I put an odd number instead, it's an odd number there. So when it's false, it leaves, it skips that, it goes into the else and it prints there. Okay. Um, so right now I was just, so let's say manually putting in the numbers you can also ask the user to specify the number by using the input function. So when you do x equal to input, 
it's going to give you, uh, it's going to prompt the user for a value such as that. And then I can enter the value and the value goes into X, right? Uh, so let's use this for another extension of the if statement, which is uh, let's have if, else if, and else, all right? So I'm, I've taken a number from the user. I am going to check if, sorry, jump there. Um, if X mod two equal to equal to zero, um, then print even. Uh, okay, I'm gonna show you a short, uh, shorter example and then ex expand on this one. Otherwise print odd, okay? So in this case, I'm basically, it's the same example as before, just that I'm taking the input from the user, but you see that I'm getting an error. Type error, not all arguments converted during string formatting. The problem is, Input by default makes it a string input. So if I'm sure that the input is going to be a number, I need to cast this with it as an integer. All right. And now if I do this, yeah, it's even. If I enter a different value, it's odd. Okay. Now let's say I want to extend this and make it um, use the if else if thing. So what I'm going to do is try, like, apart from even and odd. Um, and also you can have multiple if conditions in the same place. So is it an even number and X is less than 10, even small, okay? Else if, but the way to write it is elif, okay? Elif, you can put the next condition, which is it's even, but it's large. Uh, even large, okay? Now the other two options is odd, small and odd, even. Um, so I'm going to copy paste this once more. And I'm going to say if X mod two odd, so it should be not equal to zero and small following this, uh, this is odd. So now I have even small, even large, odd small, the one option that's left is odd large. I don't need to put a condition for that because if it did not fit in these three, it's going to be here. Okay, uh, so on the chat, Scott's mentioning that the input isn't working for him. <clears throat> so uh, what do you get when you are uh, adding, uh, doing something just this? You don't get a prompt like that. Okay, that is weird. Um, okay, let's maybe take a look at it uh, later on. Um, I get a star that shows up in, um, okay, that's. Okay, that suggests that the cell is still running. What I would suggest is do a kernel um, restart and clear output, or just a restart would also be also suffice. Just do a restart, and then just try it once again. Maybe you might do need to do a kernel interrupt, and then restart. Okay, so that's fixed. Um, cell. All right, so now we have the four conditions there, uh, even small, even large, odd small, odd large. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I forgot the colon here and there, right? So remember that if should end with the colon, elif should end with the colon, else should end with the colon. Uh, then let's try this. It's odd, large. Hmm. Why did that happen? Um, okay. Greater than equal to. I missed the boundary condition there. So 10 is even and large. It's even and it's greater than equal to 10. So it's even large. If I try instead, let's say seven, if you're going to odd small, right? So basically you have the and operator for 
joining two conditions. Similarly, you can do, have the or operator if it's like either this or that. You have if as many ellipses as you want and then followed by your else, right? Um, okay, I think that's, uh, yeah, I'll probably just move on, move on to the next bit. Um, yeah, so you have, uh, so this was we were like, we were just playing around with numbers and stuff, but we can use conditions even with lists. So let's say we have this, uh, the same list that we had before fruits consisting of apples, oranges, and mangoes. Now, if I want to check if apples is in this list fruits, I can just do that. If apples and fruits, true, okay. Um, remember it's case sensitive. So if I do, let's say capital apples and fruits, that's not gonna work, it's gonna be false, okay? So I can use this now inside uh, uh, the, an if statement as well. So it can be if apples and fruits print yes, else colon print no. Okay, so if apples and fruits, yes. If I could change it to capital A, okay. So the in operator is pretty handy and actually use it quite a bit with lists and dictionaries. Um, so similar to what, um, so this is an example using lists. I'm going to show you an example using dictionaries now. So the same one that we started off before, contacts equal to blah, blah, blah. Uh, I create that dictionary. And now what I'm wanting to check is, uh, is the key called Shailesh in, in contacts? Okay. It gives me true. And if I try Joe right now, is Joe in contacts? No, right now his entry is not there, right? So it gives me false. Um, for more clarity, probably the, the better way of doing this is Joe in contacts.keys because that's what specifically returns all the, the key, the set of keys. But this works uh, equ equivalently. Um, Anything else I wanted to cover in with the in operator? Uh, okay, yeah, what well, the one bit was, okay. So you could do the key in contacts and it worked. Now you might wonder if, can you do that for the value as well? So you have a at b.com and you want to check if it exists in contacts, which you know it does. But if you check with the in operator, it returns a false because with dictionaries, the in operator can only be used for checking on the keys not the values, right? Because context basically is like a mapping of this key belonging, uh, this key having a value so and so. So you can only do use the in operator on keys and not, not the values, all right? Um, what you could do here is a dot b in context. If you wanted to specifically check if a, this exists somewhere in the values, you could do that and it would return true because now you're specifically saying, does it exist in the values? Um, right, okay. So yeah, I'd forgotten one bit Ankur pointed out that you can even do that for strings. So, oh, actually I think one of the exercises is going to ask you to do that. So uh, since I brought it up, what I can do is uh, shy in shy dish. No, because of the case sensitive part. Okay, remember, so if I change that to that, it becomes yes. All right, so you can even use it for, so you can use the in for lists, dictionaries, strings, and probably uh, quite a bit more. Okay, now I'm going to uh, move on to the exercise and um, uh, give you, a, yeah, like a minute or half a minute, <laughs> a, a minute maybe. Um, and then I'll come up with a solution.
All right, so um, here is, let's say, a sample solution to this. So to accept a number from the user, you would do x equal to int input, because you know that input returns a string. You need to convert it into an integer, so you do that. And then basically, what like the example we did before, you're just doing two, checking two conditions. If the number is greater than zero and less than nine, it's a single digit number. If it's between greater than or equal to 10, but less than or equal to 99, it's a double digit number. If it's greater than 99, print this. So if elif elif, and if it's none of these three, you're pretty certain that the number is negative, right? So just put it under else without any further checks. So if not that, not that, not that, then this. And as an example, let's run this. If I run 76, it says it's a double digit number. If I run 1050, it says three or more digits, so on. All right. Um, okay, if I may, I would move on to loops. And I'm probably going to speed up a little bit more because I realize I'm just going at the same pace. Okay, so you have the if statements, which you saw before, and now the next, let's say, useful construct is loops. <clears throat> uh, and most of us are familiar with this from other languages as well. So, uh, so let's just continue the example that we had here. Let's say fruits. So you have fruits here. Um, okay, list. And now let's say I want to loop through every element in this list. <clears throat> so what I can do is for item in fruits. Okay. So basically I'm what I'm saying is for every item, I can name this anything. I can name this for X in fruits, whatever. For item in fruits, or maybe let, let me keep it X so that you don't think that uh, expect that there's a naming convention or a special meaning to the word item. So for X in fruits, print X. And it's basically like for each element, it's going in there. The first time it runs, it's apples. Second time it's oranges. Third time it's mangoes. It prints each of them, right? Um, so let's say you also want to print the index associated with each of them. That is like apples at zero, oranges it's one, mangoes is two, right? Zero, one, two. If you wanted the index as well, what you would do is um, for int comma x, int for index, and then you will create enumerate, okay? And then you can print int comma x. So now you have the index as well as the item itself. Uh, so this is sometimes useful when you want to use the index for accessing some other list or so on. So I mean, just useful to know that apart from the item itself, that this is the way you can fetch the index of that item in that list. Okay. Um, okay. Next, let's say you have two lists, fruits and prices. Okay. So apples, let's say cost $10 somewhere, oranges 12, mangoes 20. Okay. So you have these two lists and you want to sort of print the this and the corresponding value in the in the other uh, list. Uh, in So you want to print each item in one list and print the corresponding one in the second list, the same index. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. In this case, what you would do is uh, for x comma y, okay, and then you zip them together, okay? Fruits comma prices. And then you print x comma y. All right, uh, forgot the brackets there. So you're basically zipping fruits and prices together. And now for each of those combinations, like index zero apples in x, 10 in y, print that. You do this, you get apples 10, oranges 12, mangoes 20. Okay. Um, all right. So let's take a look at an example of a dictionary as well. So you have contacts and you have this. Now what you can do is for item in contacts, print item. What do you expect will get printed here? 
the entire value, just the key, just the value. Let's see, you basically get the keys, right? Um, if you wanted the value as well, then what you would do is the general convention is to name it for key comma val in contacts dot items. If you remember from a few lines before, um, oh, it was in the dictionary, right? Yeah, where is it? Yeah, if you do contacts or items, you basically get a tuple with the key and the value, the key and the value. And that's basically what you are using here. So using for key comma val in this print key comma val. And now you have each of the values being printed out, Shailesh, Ankur, the email addresses, so on. All right. Uh, I'm going to show you one last use case of uh, four because we used it with lists and dictionaries. Let's say you just want to run it 10 times. Now, a way of doing that in Python is you have this function called range, okay? And you can put in a number there for X in range 10, print X. And basically prints all the numbers from zero until 10, excluding 10, right? Um, so this is a way for, let's say, if you want to run the loop a specific number of times, this is what you would do. Uh, you can even, if you don't want to start at zero, but you want to start, let's say at 10 and go up to 17, then you would put this to be a number higher than your final value that you wish. And then you have from 10 to 17. All right. Um, so I think that's enough with the, the simple for loop. Uh, the other kind of loop statement that you can have is a while loop. So in this case, let's say you have a, a counter, you have set it to zero, and you're basically saying that as long as this counter is less than 10, print the value of it. But remember, it's important that you update the value of this variable within this while statement, else it will just run infinitely. Because for example, if you don't have this here, I'm not going to run it because my kernel is probably going to get stuck, is uh, that the counter is zero. If you don't modify it, it will always be zero. And this condition will always be true. So it's crucial that you make sure that you update the statement. This is just a short form of writing counter plus one, okay? So you can write it as plus equal to. And now when I do this, I'm basically printing from zero to nine. If I did instead counter plus equal to two, I'll basically be going across the even numbers, right? Uh, showing you a quick example of using continue. So let's say we have the same code as before, but this time I only want to print even numbers. So I'm going to put this back to here. In this case, we printed all the numbers from zero to nine. Here I am going from zero to nine, but whenever the number is odd, the modulo operator not equal to zero, I'm saying continue. Otherwise it will just not, this won't be true. It will just go on to the next one. It will run, Let, let's see what happens. So basically in this case, uh, it enters the for loop, it checks this condition. Let's say it's an odd number five, five mod two is not zero. The moment it encounters continue, it will skip whatever is remaining inside that while, uh, while loop and we'll just go into the next number, okay? Um, so that's how basically for the even numbers, this gets printed. For the odd numbers, you have the continue and you've just gone into the next cycle. Um, the related statement is the break statement. So in the break statement, you have some zero. Um, oh, so let's say you, we are using this for um, calculating the the, the sum of a bunch of numbers. Um, and we are going to take, keep asking the user to enter a number here. We're going to keep asking the user to enter a number unless the user enters zero. If the moment the zero value, the, the user enters zero, we stop calculating. Uh, we stop asking for more numbers and we just print the output, okay? So initially the sum is zero. While true, this is like making it an infinite loop. Okay, because the condition will never change. The way I'm going to quit uh, exit out of this while loop is by having this break. So I'm going to keep asking the user for a number. If the number is not, if it is zero, I quit and I come out. 
So let's say I start and the very first number I enter zero, the sum is zero because it, it's not going to ask prompt me again for an input. But if it asks me for a number, I enter five, it will ask me again for the next number, uh, let's say seven, this is 77, six, and one. It will keep asking me till the time I enter a zero there. And once I do, it will add up all those numbers and give me the output, which is 91. All right. So that's like for loops with numbers as well. You saw it with lists, dictionaries, and so on. Uh, okay, now maybe do a small exercise just to get a feel of using for loops in Python by yourself. Uh, I'll give you a minute, minute and a half for this. Uh, to answer Scott's question there, uh, the break statement will only break the 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 innermost loop, um, not the innermost, but the place where it's placed in. So if you have a, a for loop, uh, another for loop inside it, and then you have a, a break inside the second one, it will only break the inner for loop. The outer one will still keep running. So as an example, maybe for x in range 10, print x for y in range 20 to 25, if uh, y is greater than, I probably could have come up with an easier example. Break. <clears throat> My bad. Using F string. So Scott, probably that might answer. Um, so every time X is running from zero to 10, and you can see that Y loop, it was supposed to run from 20 to 24, but the moment it crosses 22, you have a break. So it breaks out of the inner for loop, but the outer one keeps running. All right. Okay, moving on to the solution for this one. It's um, okay. part A is creating that list. Um, then I'm going to, for each item in words, I'm going to check if the alphabet A or the string A rather is in this item. Remember we had used in with strings previously. If it does print this, and you see that Adam, Kathy, Alex, Susan, all have an A somewhere in the, in, in, in the name. Now, part C is to do this again. I'm going to add a, a divider just to make out where it is. So for item words, if A in item, print, else, break. All right, in this case, you will see that the moment it encounters Ben, which is the second element, there is no A there and the for loop is it, it's, it's broken. So it does not even go and check at the Alex, Susan and Peter. All right. Okay, let's move on to the next bit. Uh, let me know if you need a bit more time to finish that one. If not, I'm going to continue. 
Okay, so functions are basically reusable blocks of code. Joe showed you an example of a function at the start of the session, uh, which uh, as he said, is super handy for him uh, whenever he wants to create a new uh, virtual environment. So functions are re re uh, reusable blocks of code that generally are sort of packed into separate functions for specific tasks. So you won't let's say mix a bunch of tasks and put them into the same function, right? You want some level of modularity and um, yeah, especially so that it encourages reuse. Now the way to create a function is def my function, whatever name you want to give here, this is your name. Um, and then you do this. And let's say this is just a function to print hello world. All right. Now, if I call this function, I get hello world printed. If I call it five times, I get it printed five times. Um, and yeah, um, yeah. So the keyword is basically def for uh, defining a function. You have the function name, you have the, the parentheses there, the colon, which as you know, is super important and the indentation, which is what uh, conveys to Python whatever what statements go within this function. So for example, if I had this and something outside it, something something like that, okay? That something gets printed immediately because it's it's a standalone statement on its own. This is within the function and will be executed only when the function is invoked. Now, when I run my function, naturally, it's only this statement, which is contained within the function, which gets executed every time and not this. So this is another example of indentation being super, super important. All right. Um, so now we have seen how um, a, a very basic function looks like. Let's say now you want to extend this function to pass it some values. Let's say you want to pass it name, and let's say just to show you that uh, multiple arguments, uh, name and age. And now here you're going to have your f string, which is uh, the name is da da da, name and age is here. All right. And now if I call my function, it's name, uh, sorry, I have to pass it in value. And let's say 34, something like that. Does my own name wrong? Okay. The name is Shailesh and the age is 34, right? So this uh, is how you can have a function that takes in values, okay? You have parameters here, you're passing the arguments when you're calling it and you have it there. But let's say um, you want to assign some default value to these functions. So for example, if I call this function right now and I forgot to pass it a value, it will give me an error saying that it required two arguments, name and age, which I did not provide it. So what I can do is I can change it to a name and I can say a default name, empty, age equal to zero, okay? So I do this. Now, if I forget to pass the arguments, it's going to print the name is empty and age is zero. But in other times when I actually do give it a value, it would be, it would override that. So empty is just the default value for name, zero is just the default value for age. If I pass my own values, those would be over overwriting them and being used, okay? Um, Okay, Ankur's already answered that. So these functions were basically just printing stuff within them, but you can also have functions that actually do some work uh, or do some work and return the value to you. So for example, let's say, um, I'm going to make a simple one called add num1 comma num2 and then return num1 plus num2, all right? And now I can call this function, let's say 10 comma 15, and it gives me the value 25, okay? I can store this value in a variable and use it in the rest of my workflow. Uh, not a super useful function for sure at this moment, but uh, this is just an example of how you can get a return value from a, uh, from a function, all right? Um, 
yeah, I think we are good to go with the, with the exercise at this point. If you have any questions, let me know. Or uh, yeah, I'll give you a, a minute to, if you, you can copy paste bits of the code from the previous exercise uh, as the, some of the parts are similar. So that's the starter. Okay, maybe just in the interest of time, probably I won't wait and probably I'll just so show the solution and explain it. All right. Uh, I hope that's fine. Uh, so let's say you have the you have created the dictionary with uh, the keys France and England with uh, values Paris and London. Uh, now I'm creating a function called print capital. It has one, it's taking one argument called country. Part C tells me I should set it a default value of empty. If the value is not, if the, the, the argument that's been passed is not equal to, uh, is, yeah, sorry. If no argument has been passed, it will have the value empty. And if it's empty, you're, you're checking, doing the if condition and saying that error, the no country was specified. If not, you're going to check the capital of the country is and send the value of it from the dictionary. So we have two examples of calling this function, one with a valid value and the second where we have forgotten to provide a, a value. And when you run this, you will see that in the first case, it rightly sends you uh, prints capital of France, which is the entry, is the value associated with that, which is Paris. In the second case, no argument has been passed. It will use the default value and then uh, it will just print error, no country specified. All right. Um, okay, probably that's uh, uh, th that wasn't too difficult, so we can move on to error handling. So let me just create a quickly a function for instead of doing addition as before, I'm going to show you division, which is probably one of the most common examples for showing error handling issues because you have a, for example, a division by zero error. So you have a function there, uh, let's see, I defined it. And now I am doing, let's say result equal to this and I'm passing the values 10 comma two and printing result. Um, oh, sorry, num two typo. And cor correctly, the result is there, 5.0, right? But um, there are a bunch of errors that can come up when you're using a function like this. For example, instead of 10 comma two, what if I accidentally made it a string 10 comma two? Now I have an error called type error, integer and string, something that you've, you've seen before, right? So what I would do is to make this function a bit more polished by trying to handle this error by doing this. I'll say, try doing this operation attempt doing it, see if you have any issues. If yes, accept. Um, print error. That's it, for starters we do that. Okay. So um, yeah, so we do, yeah, so we pass 10 and the string it tries to do the division. Naturally, there's an, there's this error and it prints error, which is what we get. And then we are, when we're trying to print the result, obviously there's no value in it because there was, it failed and you print none. Now, this is, let's say the most very basic way of having this try accepting, which is basically try doing something. If you have a problem, then do this thing, okay? The thing is there can be different kinds of error. For example, one error that you have here is uh, associated the, with the fact that the the second operand was a string. You can also have an error because you were trying to divide by zero, right? Um, okay, let me for a moment just run this one so that you see the error, the original error message itself. Uh, yeah, the original error message would have been zero division error, division by zero. 
and i it's not a great habit to just have a generic command like a statement like this saying there was some error you're not helping the, the the user by telling him what exactly was the error how can he fix it or so on right so the right way to do it is to be more specific in the kind of errors for example one kind of error is except type error and you can say um inputs have to be numbers okay the other error you can have is the zero division error that you saw here right zero division error and here you can have written um denominator denominator cannot be zero right and apart from this you can have a fallback let's say a catch everything error which is just saying print some un i don't know i mean this isn't a great way to do it but just to demonstrate some unknown error now we run this when it's a string it says inputs have to be numbers when you put it in uh, the second number is zero it gives you denominator cannot be zero so now you're actually providing error message which is useful to the to the user of your program so that they know what it is that they're doing incorrectly you can even make it this error message even better by telling which of the arguments was the incorrect one uh, first argument was a string second was a string whatever and so on so basically a try is like try to do something and then you can try to catch the error and based on the type of error you can do actions appropriately it doesn't just have to be print statements it can be even like you might have opened a file this might just be for um i oh, know that's actually in the finally which i'm going to show you um or okay i think i'm just going to leave it as an uh, something uh, just introduce it but not do an example right now is that uh, apart from the try except which you have done here you have a couple of more options called else and finally so else defines a block of code so similar to what you were doing here but you can have a third block which is else something like that uh, now else defines a block of code to be executed if no errors were raised so if you did do try and everything worked well there was no error the else will get executed it's something like for housekeeping duties or cleaning up at the end uh, on the other hand you have finally finally which irrespective of whether there was an error or whether there was an error or whether it was successful this would still be executed at the end so depending on um, the way you have written your code you might find users for using the else in addition to try and accept and maybe even the finally or all four of them try accept else finally as well um Okay, a small example, a small exercise here for you. Uh, uh, okay, maybe instead of waiting, I'll just take you through the through the solution ju just so that we can speed up a bit. So part A is create a dictionary named countries. Again, the same one, like that. And then I'm going to create a function. Okay, so basically we can copy the function we created the previous time. Um, yeah, you can create the function we copied this the previous time. The only difference being right now we are going to check if, um, uh, okay, maybe first I should have just shown you that if I did countries of, um, I don't know, India, let's say, I get an error because India is not a key in this dictionary at this point. So it's a key error. So I'm going to do an error handling in this function to tackle this issue, which is try accept, uh, but specifically key error. And I'm just going to print that um, no info available for this country. All right. And now if I try doing print capital, let's say India, it gives me no info available for India. If I had tried doing this on our previous example without the error handling, let's say this one, if I had tried that here, 
I would have gotten the key error problem because we didn't have an error handling for non-existent countries there. So basically what I did is wrap this entire thing inside a try except, inside a try except, and you have the value there. Okay, so moving on, uh, importing modules. Um, so now modules are like um, pieces of code or software, or pieces of code and software that basically perform some, some specific functionality. They're basically like the libraries that you would have used in C, C++ and so on. Uh, and you're basically just importing already written code by you or someone else and basically reusing that code in your own program. So as a very, very basic example, let me take um, from date time. Now date time is a package uh, in Python and it has inside this package, there is a sub module called as date. Okay. And date gives me a function called date.today. That's a function defined in that sub module. If I do that, I get the date. So what basically what I've done is I've used a, a library, a module called date time. Uh, within that, there is a sub module called date, which has a function called today, which gives me this, this value. All right. This particular module, apart from date, it also has other sub modules as well. So apart from date, I can also do date.time. And uh, there is date.today like we did before. And this other module has some also a date.today, but this one, as the name suggests, it gives me the date and the time, right? So that's in my local time right now. Um, so, Basically, uh, you can import a, a module entirely. I can do that. If I'm doing that, then I would have this print statement as date time dot date. Okay. So if you just see how it's, in this case, I'm saying that from this module, import this sub module. And then I can directly, because I've imported that submodule directly, I can directly use it here. In this case, I'm not talking about the submodules, but I'm just saying import that package called date time. So that's, that, that's the only thing Python knows at this point. So then I have to do use the module dot, the submodule dot, the function, that entire thing. So that's why it's very common to use this where a package can contain a lot of functionality, a package would be large, and you probably don't need all the functionality within that package. So if you would know that you specifically need just this or that, you would just import that much from there and use it in your program, all right? Um, the other things is that, for example, this date time, it's, it's pretty long, right? Date time, maybe not too long, but let's, uh, let me exaggerate and say it sounds too wordy to use every time. So what I can use is I can say import date time as DT. It's like an alias. I'm gonna say, I'm going to refer to date time in my code as DT. So this statement can now be shortcutted to DT.date.today. It still gives me the same output. I can use do the same at this level as, as well. From date time, import date as, I don't know, as D and then do Instead of this, I can just do d dot today. So as is just like sort of giving it a different name in to how you're going to refer to it. You'll find that this is very common uh, when you're using certain libraries like NumPy and Matplotlib, which we are going to quickly look into. Um, so that's why I introduced that. Okay. Very quickly, I just want to show you some uh, one other thing is that. Um, We've been doing this d dot date, okay? Uh, d dot today, oh, or rather, let me start with a simpler example. Um, you have when you want to print the value of variables, you must have seen that you you are able to do this, and you are able to do print. Both seem to give you similar outputs. Uh, the thing is, for very basic data type, this might be true, but this is not always true. So, for example. Remember here we are doing print d.today, it gives you a nice output, 
but if you did not use the print statement and you would use just that, it gives you the object representation of it. Now, why this happens is, let's say, a bit more involved and it's uh, to how an object has a, a representation and a string represent and a string attribute. So let's not go into that. Uh, just know that using a print is more likely to give you a better output every time than just printing the variable as it is. Okay, so this just being a case and example. Um, I'm going to skip this exercise for the reason that it's basically asking you to do the very same thing I did there. Um, so I'm just going to skip that exercise and move on to the last two bits um, for called NumPy and Matplotlib. So NumPy is basically is probably one of the most widely used scientific computing packages in Python. It provides you a whole lot of functionality that I think MATLAB users are used to. So it provides support for arrays, large matrices, and a whole lot of built-in functions, uh, library of functions to operate on these matrices as well. Um, so as an example, I'm gonna keep it simple and instead of a mat mat matrix, I'm just going to go with an array. So remember we had a, uh, we, we discussed about lists and let's say we had a list like that. Now, if I wanted to calculate the sum and average of the numbers in this list, of every item, of all the items in this list, I would have had to do something like that, which is like the sum, initializing the sum to zero, and then for every number in, in this list, adding it to the sum. And then once the for loop is over, all the numbers are done, I'll go, I'll do sum by the length of the numbers, that is the number of entries, and that gives me the average, right? And in this case, let's say it's 53, this. Now I can do this way more quickly using NumPy. So import NumPy, uh, and people just find writing NumPy every time pretty long. Uh, so you can make it shorter into NP. And then I can create an array inside uh, using uh, NumPy. So I can say my numbers is a NumPy array with basically the same values. Now, I don't need to write these values again here. I can even make a NumPy array from an existing list. So I can just do that. I have a Python list. I can feed that as numpy.arrays argument. I do this. And now if I print my nums, I basically have an array of these things. I can print the first item, the last item, like we've been used to doing stuff. But additionally, I get a whole lot of extra functionality. I can do my nums.sum. I get the same sum there. I get mean. I, so basically, I'm getting all these functions pre-built. And the thing is, it's you can write these manually, but it's extra work for you. But these NumPy functions are very optimized for speed and for performance. So they're always way better than trying to manually write them. So you're always encouraged to use NumPy's functions wherever they are. NumPy arrays are much faster than using gen, uh, regular Python lists. So you would find that most simulators and everything that are built on uh, Python would use or make use of NumPy arrays rather than doing the same thing using Python lists. Additionally, you have other functions as well, such as max, the largest value in that matrix, which is nine. Similarly, min, the smallest number in there. Um, you can also do my nums into do. Now this is not going to, unlike in list where you saw that all the numbers got repeated, what this does is it multiplies every item by two. Okay, each entry by two, the values are getting multiplied. Um, so, I think that's like a very brief overview of NumPy. I'm just, okay, just for the, since I have a couple of extra minutes from not doing the exercises, I'm going to show you how you can create matrices as well. So I can do make a array of just five zeros by doing that. So it's a 1D array of five zeros. I can instead make a matrix of five rows and two columns all with zeros. 
Similarly, you have a function for doing, making it all ones. What you could also do is take this, multiply with some number, let's say five, and now you have all fives. The other way to do it is, um, let's say rather seven here, that was all sevens. You can use the function full to basically fill a matrix of five rows and two columns with the number seven. This equal equivalent ways of doing it. Um, then let's say rather if you want a, a matrix of five comma two with random numbers, you can say np dot random dot random. So this is numpy, the submodule, the function, and then you can print this. So you basically have five rows, two columns, with um, all with random numbers. So every time I'm going to print this, I'm going to get slightly different values, as you see. Every time it's generating the new random value. Within this matrix, I can access, let's say the row zero, column one. So I get that value, even with more precision when I'm just printing the single value there. I can print the entire first row by doing data zero. Okay, so I get both of those. Now, um, there is, let's say, another way of specifying indices. That is, what I'm saying here is, the row zero and all the columns. Now this is basically going to give me the same output as here, but let's now try exchanging these two. Let's have the col column first and then this. And what would happen here is all the rows for column zero. So we, sh we should be expecting this, 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 this. And that's what we get, 0 0.72, 0 0.4. So you're getting the first column taken out. And naturally what follows is if you do colon, comma, colon, you're basically just doing getting the entire matrix itself. So this basically stands for all in that dimension. So all rows, all columns. Yeah, as Ankur pointed out, this is probably particularly interesting for MATLAB users. I think somebody had posted previously on the chat. All right. Um, uh, I have... Probably I should wind up in five minutes, so I'm not going to do this exercise. Uh, these Jupyter notebooks are going to be shared with you. The solutions are going to be shared with you, so you will have time to uh, run through them on your own. I'm already on overtime, so probably I'm just going to wind up with Matplotlib very quickly. Sorry to keep Uncle waiting so long. Um, yeah, it took me way longer than I anticipated. Okay, so. Moving on to matplotlib. Now matplotlib is a Python library for plotting, for making graphs, figures um, of various kinds. So there certainly are several such packages in Python, um, Seaborn, Bokeh, Plotly, and so on. Matplotlib is probably, um, yeah, matplotlib is probably, let's say the most widely used one. Uh, you'll find a lot of support for it online. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, it, it just follows that it's a good candidate for a uh, Python crash course uh, as compared to the other uh, more, let's say more recent plotting libraries. So uh, in, for this particular example, I'm going to use NumPy for generating my data. And then I'm going to use matplotlib. Now matplotlib has a, let's say a sub, a sub module called pyplot. And I don't want to use this big name every time. So I'm going to say, import this as PLT. Now this, these two are, let's say, super common conventions for importing these modules and packages. Uh, and I'm just, so you, you probably find these in forums and everywhere that they are, uh, the functions are used as PLT dots, so on. Uh, now what I'm going to do is, remember we had the function called range 10, um, which basically gave you numbers from zero to nine. Now NumPy has something similar, which is NumPy np dot a range and you can give a starting and an ending and it basically generates a similar array of numbers starting with the first digit and ending just before the previous one. Okay, zero to nine. Um, so, okay, so that's my, let's say my X axis that I'm going to plot. X equal to NP dot A range this and all right there. Uh, and then let's say I'm going to create my y-axis and let's say I'm just going to do plot the squares and the cubes. So I have, 
one of my plots is going to plot raised to power raised to two and the other power raised to three. So it's NP dot power, okay? And basically what I'm feeding in is the values of X, but each element raised to two, each element raised to three and saved here. So if you want to take a look at what Y1 contains, it's that. And similarly, Y2 would have this, okay? Uh, okay, now plotting at the very basic level is super easy. It's just plt dot x y one, and you have your x axis values here, which were zero to nine, and the y axis values there, which is basically the power. So eight would have sixty four, six would have thirty six, so on. You can plot multiple lines on the uh, on the same graph. So x y one uh, plot x comma y one plot x comma y two. And you have that there. Um, you can also, let's say, plot slightly different functions. Um, you can, okay, let's have the same x here. And I'm going to create a sine function. So, which is y1 is equal to sine of np dot sine of x. And this can be cos. Okay, I have that. And then I can just plot like we did before. Okay, so you you could just make out their sign and cos, but the reason is there is not enough uh, discretization there. So what I can say is zero to 10. So just to show you, when you do zero to 10, it was going zero, one, two, three, four steps of one. Now I can specify that the steps should not be one, but it can be, let's say, point 0.1. So it, instead of this, it will go to 0, 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, so on. So it's basically giving me more resolution. So if I use that, more resolution, I calculate the new y1, y2s, and I plot it, I look, get more familiar looking sine and cos waves, sine and cosine waves. OK. Um, the exercise like before, I'm going to leave it for you, but rather I'm going to show you just a few more things that you can do on your plot. So you you had these plots there, you can add labels to them. So you can add a X axis label, a Y axis label, doing PLT dot X label, Y label. You can have a, a title added at the top and you can also have a legend associated. And now when you do it, you see you have the, the title at the top the x-axis label, whatever you want, the y-axis label, and you can you have a small legend box there. Um, now, just for you to get an idea about, I mean, how flexible and how much how, many, how much you can customize these plots, you can even have the sine and cosine in, let's say, two separate subplots within the same figure, like panel A, panel B. So this is the, let's say, I'm just going to show you the output. So it basically uses the command subplot to say that you want two rows, one column. So two rows, one column. And this is the first of those entries. And this is the second of those entries. And in one, I'm plotting x, y, one. The other, I'm plotting x, y, two. If instead of different rows, you just wanted in them as different columns. So one figure here, one over there. In that case, you would have just slightly modified the code to this instead of, um, Oh, sorry, that's slightly long. It should be one here. Yeah. So instead of two, one, that's row column. I'm saying one row, two columns. And then, so instead of panel A, panel B, top, bottom, you get it left, right. Um, additionally, you would have just seen that apart from X, Y, then I have now sort of specified the color of the trace that I want, which is R standing for red. B standing for blue. And in addition to that, I've made the line a dashed line by putting like this double dash. There's lots of such flexibility and customization that you can do. You'll find plenty of support online and documentation online. So um, yeah, you'd never be sort of short on info or help on how to go about doing this. So this, uh, this Jupyter notebook would be shared with you after this, uh, I mean, probably pretty soon with, with the solutions as well. So sorry, we could not, we didn't have enough time to go through each of the exercises 
um, uh, with more time to spare. But I think I've left Ankur waiting too, too long and I think um, I should pass this on to him. And that's the end of part two of this talk. And I, Ankur's gonna give you a, a like a use case demo um, of how to use Python in your, in your scientific work. So over to you, Ankur. Great, um, yeah, um, I won't take very long because um, the schedule for three hours, luckily we don't have any other sessions today at CNS. So we can steal another 20 minutes. Um, I think maybe let's take a three minute break just so people can stretch their legs and get to your coffee. And um, then I'll take about 15 to 20 minutes and then we can wrap up with uh, a short discussion depending on how people feel. Okay, so let's come back in three minutes. I'll put a timer on. Okay, I will see you all in three minutes. Um, just briefly, I'm going to uh, give you an idea of how to write your own modules. I'm not going to go into details, but I'll show you how uh, it's very, very easy to write your own modules and how you can organize your code. Um, and then I'll take two minutes to show you how you can lint your code, which makes uh, a world of difference when you're writing complicated code and you're doing lots of transformations. Okay, so we'll come back in two minutes. In the meantime, if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat and we can have a look. I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. There's a terminal on the left and my browser and the timer in front of it. Looks good. Yep, all good. Okay, lovely. Great, so there was a loud ting in my ear, which means time is up. Um, so um, we've all already seen quite a bit. I'm, um, I'm sure all of that was very useful to give you uh, a nice walkthrough of what you can do through Python. Um, there is a huge ecosystem out there. So if you go to pypy.org, right, you can browse through 313,000 projects that you can install using pip as Joe showed you, right? So it's pip install and whatever the name of the project is. So uh, some of you may be aware of 
the elephant library, that neural ensemble um, develops. To install elephant, you go pip install elephant in your virtual environment. It's as simple as that. Okay, and there are, there are many, many libraries. There are, there's a whole scientific Python um, ecosystem. So you've got, I'll just write them down to you. So you've got NumPy, Matplotlib, you've got SciPy, you've got stats models. Um, uh, what am I missing? Joe, Shellish, Marcel? There's one more. Well, I covered them all. Pandas, there you are. Yeah. Right, so, so these are extremely well maintained. Uh, quite a few of them are well funded. So um, they are very, very optimized because most of them are written in C. So you don't have, um, you don't lose speed because Python itself is an interpreted language. Um, additionally, some of them also support, uh, let's say GPUs and so on. So it's quite useful. Um, and if you are into AI and all that, you do know that there's PyTorch and TensorFlow and all of that. So that's all part of the Python ecosystem. Um, what we wanted to, what we thought would be good to show you is um, how you would actually go about doing a project normally, right? So let's say you, you're doing, ah, scikit, yes. So if you search, luckily you have scikit by open. So if you look at scikit, you'll see that it's a whole suite of lots of um, sub projects for different uh, purposes, right? Um, So until now we've been working in uh, the Jupyter Notebook. Um, I'm on my terminal, as you see on the left, I've got my virtual environment active. Um, unlike Joe who creates a folder, I create a hidden folder, just so that when I do LS, I don't have to see my VE and V each time, but I can of course see it with this, right? I can't see it, I'll forget it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, so my virtual environment is active. I can now verify that it is active. So um, which Python tells me that Python is within my virtual environment. And of course, if I want to run a Jupyter Notebook, I go Jupyter Notebook. This is what you've all done today, right? And this should open up uh, in my browser, right? This is what we've done today. Um, yeah, my theme's a bit messed up, so mine looks different, but please ignore that. Um, Okay, now Jupyter Notebooks are of course extremely useful um, and they are very, very useful for daily, let's say prototyping because you can make notes in them. So they are a combination of Python code, all your plots um, and a lot of text because you can use Markdown in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and so uh, quite a few people use them on a daily basis. Uh, the advantage is also that while you're testing things out, you can note what you've done. So I know quite a few people that now use them as journals when they are prototyping their models or analysis and so on. But the truth is that uh, when your code starts to get more and more complex, Jupyter notebooks are slightly harder to use. Uh, so at some point you do have to come down to just using your editor. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show you now. Uh, so in the Python folder, you can see that you've got the notebook here, but instead of using the notebook, I'm just going to open a new file with Python, right? So I'm going to call this main.py, okay? And now, because I have, my um, editor is, as you can see, quite customized. I can show that to you in full screen. So um, we'll probably do a session on IDEs later. I, I guess that's something the software working group could do. But in general, um, it's important to use a good IDE because it has lots of features that make your life a lot easier, okay? So let's say at the moment, I'm going to write just a main function, right? And that's what I'm going to do. Now, what I'm going to do along with this is that I'm going to open a terminal on this side, where I'm going to go to the same thing. Okay, I think I've ended up in the wrong location because I've got nothing here. Documents code, others. Oh, 
of course I need to be in the Python folder. Okay, and now we can see my file here. So the traditional way of running anything Python or Python script is to go first I, um, right? And the, the traditional way is you go Python and the name of your script. So in my case, I'd go Python main.py. Now you notice that nothing happened. This is because while I've defined the function here on my left, I've not actually called the function, right? So calling the function means something of that sort, right? And now you can see that we do get an output. So um, in general, uh, what a lot of people do is they'd have one file that has everything in it. What we want you to do is consider splitting your code into different files, right? So shell touch touched the modules briefly and luckily modules in Python are just different files. Any file that defines any functions or does anything in it, it becomes a module. So for example, um, let's say a general modeling pipeline could be that I have my model.py, right? Uh, don't worry about the doc strings and things. I'll discuss them after we've done this. So let's say I do my model. At the moment, I'm not giving any arguments. I'm just saying, Okay. Now, after we've got a model uh, in computation science, we like to keep a model and simulation separate because the model is, well, literally the mathematical model. The simulation includes implement implementation details. So let's say we do something like, like that, right? And then I can define a function that says my sim, and then I can print Okay, so now if you look at this, we've got a main file, we've got a different file for our model. We've got a different file for our simulation. Similarly, let's say I want to have, I want my post-processing to come here. So I can have a different file called my uh, post-processing and I can define as many functions as I want, right? It doesn't have to be one function. I'm only showing you one um, for, simpl for simplicity, but let's say I call this my PP, right? Uh, and I say print okay and so on so for example the last step could be after post processing let's say you want um, your final analysis and plotting right so you could go And then similarly, for example, you could have customized plotting using matplotlib. Um, so you could go. All right, so what we've done is we've taken logical pieces of our code and we spread them out into different files. In Python, any file that defines functions or variables of this form is a module, right? Any of them. And as Shelley showed you when you imported NumPy, what you can actually do here is go from simulation, let's say, or actually let's just do, I think I called it my model. And then over here, I can just go I'll quickly check what I called it because I've forgotten. Right, so I called it my model. What I'm doing here is that I am, um, I think I've forgotten my syntax, yeah, there we go. Right, so what I'm doing is I define my model in a different file when I want to use it, I'm just going to import the relevant bits. So this model file, which I can show you here, right? It can have any number of functions. It can have 10, 15, it can have different types of model. It can have uh, your model with different parameters. Uh, you could also pass arguments here to, to build different models. 
the, the point is that this function is separated from your simulation, right? But in your main function, you can just import it and call it, right? Now, after my model, for example, I could do right because I think that's what I've called my function. And now, if you look on the right hand side, and I run this, I uh, forgot to call my function. Right. This is a very, very simple uh, example of how to divide your code into different modules and import them. Um, now, over here, I'm importing all of this to main, but there's no reason why you only have to import them to main, right? So for example, if I didn't want, uh, I could instead do this here in my simulation. So let's say I do, right? And then for example, you could initialize your model here with some arguments if you wanted. Right. So this, this allows you to organize your code. Um, if you use version control like Git and so on, then this makes it even easier because uh, when you make a change to your model, uh, your simulation file remains untouched, which means when you go through your history to see what changes you've made, they're very nicely organized, right? So in the long term, something like this is quite useful. So that was the first thing I wanted to show you, right? It's, it's very, very easy. So people coming from uh, MATLAB would find this familiar because in MATLAB, you can do the same thing, right? You can define different M files and then import them and use their functions. Uh, people from C, C++ would know that you can have different headers that you can include. It's very similar. Uh, the, the easy bit here is that it's just a file. You just have to uh, add your functions and bits in there and it just runs, okay? So that was the, the first thing, that is Python modules. Um, and then we thought we'd um, quickly discuss linting. Um, because the idea behind linting is that it, it allows you to catch common errors really quickly, right? Without uh, you having to do anything really special. So for example, um, the most common lint engine for Python is called Flake 8. So you can do, okay, and that should install it for you. Once you've installed Flake 8, you'll see that you have some Flake 8 commands, right? And if you run Flake 8 in your directory where all your Python files are, Oh, really, looks like my code is excellent, which is hard to imagine. But let me add a few um, issues then. Yeah, so um, if you use an IDE, you can integrate these things into your IDE. So you can already see that my IDE is telling me that I've done something wrong over here. But from the command line, if you run flake eight, right? What this does is it statically analyzes your code and it'll point out common issues in your code that you can fix. Um, these are their recommendations, right? You don't have to follow these, but a lot of the time, this is how we learn new things about Python that we wouldn't otherwise run into, right? So for example, there is an error 261. Um, Flake also allows you to look at errors. So if you look at um, help, there's a way of making it more verbose. There are lots of options, of course, as usual, but So in this scenario, it's saying that in my main file, which I can open on the right hand side, it's saying that on line 16, there should be two spaces before my inline comment. So here, okay. And it's also saying that I have a trailing white space, which I should get rid of. So now if I do this and actually write a comment, let's say, well, that will make Blake happy. Okay, um, uh, for example, Shailesh had mentioned that when you use a try catch block, you shouldn't use an empty accept. Um, so for example, I can do five B equals, let's say SDR. And now if I do try, Uh, 
okay? And if you don't click over here, it tells you that in this line here, right, it tells you that in this line, in line 24 of my code, I'm using a bare except, which means I'm not actually specifying what sort of exception could be thrown, right? So um, it points at very, very common issues. Um, you can easily ignore them, right? So Flake is quite configurable. So um, uh, a common issue that people talk about is that uh, right, so this line is now much longer than 80 characters. Um, and by default, Flake should point this out, right? So it says E509, the line is too long. You should try and limit it to 79 characters. This is no longer required. Um, some, some projects will still um, ask you to limit your lines to 79 characters, but uh, it's not necessary anymore because we do have wider screens. And um, you can configure Flake 8 by adding a configuration file. For example, you can do Flake 8, and it just says this. Okay, and you add the error. Okay, so all I've done here is added a configuration file that tells Flake that please, please don't bother me about this particular error. And if I've done that right, okay, and we now see that that particular error is no longer shown up. So, uh, so it's a good idea to use this because um, it teaches you lots of things. It'll point out lots of things that you may not otherwise realize. Okay, and um, what I generally do is when it gives me something, the first thing I do is I'll go on my favorite uh, search uh, uh, website and I'll look for it. And then it gives you a very nice explanation of why this is a good thing or why this is a bad thing and so on and so forth. So that is the first linter that we wanted to cover. That's Flake 8. Um, for the second one, uh, we're going to cover a feature that is very, very new. Um, it's only in Python 3. Um, and this is called type checking, right? So by now you've seen that in Python, your variable A does not have a type, right? It is the value that has the type. So over here, A is, at the moment, it's going to be an integer only because an integer is being assigned to it, okay? So Python is strongly typed because every object in Python will have a specific type, but at the same time, it's dynamically typed, which means the type of your variable will change depending on what value is assigned to it, okay? But with great flexibility also comes great opportunity to make errors, right? So for example, in this case, because it's quite possible that at some point I did have b equals 10, but then I wrote lots of code. And at some point I reassigned b to a string, right? It's perfectly valid in Python because it's dynamically typed. You can totally do this. But then you notice how this results in an error, right? So what, um, what Python 3 now allows you to do is give type hints, right? So they're not part of the source code really. They don't really do anything at runtime, but you can give type hints. And that's as easy as adding a comment that says this. Okay, again, my linter doesn't like it when I do things like this, right? So when I define B, I want it to be an integer, but now if I say something else over here, let's say, um, So similar to Flake 8, which is for static analysis and gives you information on uh, practices. Um, for type hinting, there's a package called MyPy, right? So you do pip install MyPy. In the meantime, I'll check my syntax. It's possible that I've done that wrong. So this is the documentation page. Um, 
I can show you that here. So it allows you to give type hints to lots of different things. So you can give type hints to, let's say for example, um, variables, but you can also give um, them to functions, which is where it gets really, really useful, right? So uh, I'm trying to find an example here for you. Um, yeah. Right, so you do, an, you do an assignment and with the comment, you just say type and what the type should be, right? And that will tell Python that the expected type for this should be any. And therefore, if you run MyPy on it later, if this type doesn't match, it'll point this out to you, okay? Uh, it becomes more important when you then want to give arguments to functions. So let's say I wanted to give it um, some argument. What I can do now, is I can say that the type should be a string, okay? And now if I pass something that's not a string uh, to main, then my pi will point it out to you. So for example, here you can already see that my editor is now saying that there are incompatible types in the assignment. It should have been a string, but I've, uh, well, it should have been an int, but I've given it a string, right? So this sort of thing just helps you improve your code a little bit. So that was type hinting. Um, I've given you the link to the documentation. It's very easy. It's just commenting your code slightly better uh, and being aware of what the type should be. Uh, it also forces, forces you to think a lot more about uh, what it is you're writing and how your variables and data is being transformed when it goes from one function to another or one module to another. Okay, so that was the second thing. Uh, the final thing that I want to talk to you is about doc strings. Um, and this also shows you why using a good IDE is important because you'd have noticed when I write DEF, Vim gives me some suggestions in the drop down, and these are snippets that Vim supports. Okay, so I'm quite sure Atom supports them. I think Sublime Text also supports them. Um, a lot of IDEs have them built in. And if I hit tab, it'll let me uh, pretty much, it, it prints a template for a function, and then I just have to fill in the right places. Um, an important thing, a very, very important thing that this does is that this adds a doc string, um, which is what you see here between the two triple quotes. And a doc string is used um, to comment what the function is meant to do. Um, so for example, in this case, I'm going to say my main function. Um, it doesn't have any parameters, but you could, for example, do this. Right, so I could add a name here. Uh, let's say it returns um, again. All right, and then for example here I can do return name. Um, okay, so when I run name here, On running this, it should return NKUR, right? But the, the important bit about the doc string is that most IDEs will read these doc strings and make them available to you in other files. Okay, so as an example, if I import NumPy here, right? Most IDEs will then let you look at the documentation for NumPy. Uh, sorry, I don't have NumPy installed apparently. NumPy. If you're using a good IDE, uh, generally when you're writing a function, it'll generally do a pop-up that shows you the, doc the documentation for that particular function, for example. So it'll tell you um, what arguments should come in next and so on and so forth. Right, so for example, if I want to do Right, so A it does completion. And when I start writing this, you can see that it, it already tells me what the different options are for this, right? And then I know that my start is whatever zero, my stop is one, I want my step to be 0.1, okay? And then,
if I go on arrange, you'll see that it pops up um, the doc string, right? So if you, if you went to the NumPy website and looked at the API documentation, this is pretty much what you'd see, okay? Um, similarly, if I go to uh, a range, it shows me the doc string for a range and what to do with it, right? Um, Joe, uh, Shellish, Marcel, anything else you think worth covering? This is all I had on my list pretty much. I think it's good. Okay, so let me quickly share docs and doc strings with you. Okay. Stop sharing my screen now. I don't think I have anything left to show. Okay, great. Um, I think we covered pretty much everything we had planned. Um, uh, I guess we can do uh, an intermediate or advanced Python sometime later if, if people think that's useful, but I think for a start, this was very, very uh, useful to most people. Um, if you're still here, we do have a quick a three minute, well, it's not even three minutes, it's two minutes, um, just a feedback form so that, uh, just with your general comments as to what you thought, um, if there were any topics that we, for example, forgot to cover or what topics you'd like to see in the future. So it's it's literally got three questions. They're just text boxes, there are no multiple choice questions. We don't make you choose anything. So if you could just fill your feedback in there, that would be very useful to us when we try and organize uh, the next set of tutorials. Um, I guess that's all, we can stop the recording now. We will send out the recording as soon as Zoom sends us a link. Uh, we tend to update the SCED description. Uh, we'll also email um, the recording link to everybody who's an attendee on SCED. And um, after the conference, all of these will also be uploaded to uh, YouTube, probably on the INCF channel, because we are an INCF uh, working group. Um, and yeah, I think with that, we are happy to, let's stop the recording.